my phone. Good morning. I'd like to call the uh, regularly scheduled planning commission meeting for June 13th, 2019 to order. If you would, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. morning um, I believe we have a time certain presentation so uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump into that who's who's on point there is oh, mr. mr. Dan um, so uh, again we'll go ahead and uh, <coughs> do the time certain item and then we'll move on to the uh, the regular agenda so if you could please introduce the uh, uh, item number 10 please Well, excuse me, Mr. Chair, I think yes, we ma'am. should handle the update memo because there are some public hearings not going to be heard today. And I think okay. Margaret should read that into the record okay. in case anyone's here for those. Okay. All right. Ms. Tusing, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, Margaret Tusing with Building and Development Services, and this is the changes to the agenda. Item number six is Ordinance 1911, Lakewood Center, DRI number 27. Uh, the revised motion is to continue this to the July 11th, 2019 Planning Commission meeting at 9 a.m. time at 9 a.m. or as soon thereafter as may be heard, and it needs to be re-advertised. Item number seven is PDMU 0630GR5, Lakewood Center General Development Plan. This is also a revised motion to continue the meeting until July 11th, 2019 at 9 o'clock a.m. or as soon as may be heard, and it also needs to be re-advertised. Item number nine, PDMU 1905ZG, the Springs at Ellington. There are updates to the staff report. There's a revised general development plan and a project narrative attached to the update memo. And then item number 10 is a 9 a.m. time certain. It's LDCT text amendment 1805, ordinance 1902, which is a land development code text amendment for accessory dwelling units. And there are changes to the staff report, ordinance, and public comment letter attached to the update memo. And those are the changes to the agenda this morning. Very good. Very good. Um, are there any uh, changes from the... Uh County Attorney. No changes, Mr. Thank Chief. you very much. So again, uh, to clarify, items six and seven, correct, Margaret? Uh, items six and seven are being continued um, to j the uh, July 11th meeting. So if you're here for those two items, uh, again, they're not going to be heard today. They're going to be continued. So thank you very much. All right. So we're going to go ahead and move on to item number 10. Uh, the time certain item. So again, if you could please introduce item number 10 into the record. Thank you. Item number 10 is Land Development Code Text Amendment 1805, Ordinance 1902. It is an amendment to accessory dwelling units. This is a legislative item. Josh Dan is the uh, planner for this, and he is here for presentation. This is amending the Land Development Code by amending Chapter 2 definitions to provide a definition for accessory dwelling unit amending Chapter 4 zoning by adding accessory dwelling unit as a use in the specified zoning districts in Section 401.2, Schedule of Uses, Table 4.1, Residential Uses, amending Chapter 5, Part 2, Standards for Accessory Uses and Structures to create a new Section 511.18, Accessory Dwelling Units, to provide development standards and guidelines for accessory dwelling units, providing that accessory dwelling units shall not be considered dwelling units in and density calculations, amending Chapter 10, Transportation Management, Section 1005, Off-Street Parking Ratios, to address accessory dwelling units. And as I said, Josh Dan is here for presentation. Very good. And again, this is legislative, and there's no uh, need to be sworn, nor is there any concern with ex parte communications. No, they're not, not, not applicable. Not applicable. Thank you. Good morning. As was mentioned, my name is Josh Dan. Um, <clears throat> I'm a planner here with Comprehensive Planning, and um, uh, just get into some of the minor changes that were made since the last presentation to your commission. Um, staff presented to your commission on April 11th, 2019, <clears throat> and at that meeting, your commission voted in favor of recommending 
this item be presented to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> since that time, staff have made minor changes to the ADU draft ordinance to clarify a few things that were within the draft ordinance. Um, <clears throat> we have returned today to present them to your commission and the public as well. Uh, and then if I could just start diving into it. Um, I have highlighted portions of some of these changes as were made. Um, and this is also in the documents uh, before you. So there is a slight change to the um, definition. The highlighted portion as on the screen, I'll read it out loud, has been added. The accessory dwelling unit shall be held in common ownership with the principal dwelling and shall not be considered dwelling units for purposes of, cal of excuse me, of calculating density. Um, <clears throat> this was added um, to be consistent with section 511.18.A, uh, the intent and purposes. Um, and I'll turn to that one right now. Uh, the first part has similar language uh, added to it. Um, I'll read that as well. And shall be considered dwelling units for purposes of calculating density in the aforementioned zones. Um, this was mentioned and staff had noticed um, had existed prior in previous versions, but for some reason had been struck from the uh, document you all had received on the 11th. Uh, we wanted to make sure it was still in there. It was understood and described at that meeting. Uh, we just wanted to make sure the language was present in the um, ordinance. The second portion being part two um, <clears throat> was language, I guess, better worded to describe um, the need for a resident or the owner to reside in either the ADU or the primary dwelling. And um, we were able to come up with the line as highlighted either the accessory dwelling unit or the primary dwelling shall be owner occupied, it's easily, which would easily describe our intent in that. Um, <clears throat> in the, uh, the highlighted portion is the, the language that was added for clarification. That's correct. Thank you. Um, moving on to 511.18b, number five, there was um, concern at that presentation with regard to bus stops not always being in the same place, um, sometimes moving or being removed. Um, the following language was added in the event. The, the bus stop or public transit station is relocated further than the required distance than an existing accessory dwelling unit shall not be deemed non-conforming as to parking pursuant to section 107 of this code, that being the LDC. Um, that same language was added to footnote 19 in table 10-2, the parking ratios, to be consistent with this portion of uh, the code, or the draft uh, ordinance, I should say. Um, aside from that, there was no other changes. Um, staff is still scheduled to present to the Board of County Commissioners on June 20th and August 1st. Okay. Thank you. All right. Is that a... That's, that the that's summary it. of changes? Okay, yeah. very good. Um, Mr. Rutledge, do you have a question? So, yeah, I had a question. So is this uh, ordinance in, in concert or in, similar to others that are being issued in places like Pinellas County, Hillsboro, Palm Beach, Dade County? Is there a model that you use or some places is in, in, in place currently? Yeah, so staff reached out and uh, collected model ordinances from not only our area, uh, Sarasota, Pinellas, um, and just all around uh, city of Bradenton. But it was direction from the board at our work session with them in December that we basically write our own that's unique to us. So we took a lot of things um, trying to learn from their examples and uh, were able to draft this ordinance. So you did some research, found out what things were working and weren't working. I mean, they're not, Pinellas is not like Manatee County and right. Bradenton's not like us. So I, I get the idea, but. I guess the, the sense I like to have is that other people are doing this, it's working, they've manipulated it. We're a little behind that group and ahead of others, 
but we're not going blindly. You just didn't sit down and write this on Tuesday, right? Yeah, no, definitely. We've uh, we've done quite a bit of research on this, and um, it's been in the works now for, I guess, over a year. Okay, thank you. Very good. And uh, again, we had a more in-depth discussion previously. These are just changes for clarifications based on a uh, discussion at the Board of County Commissioner um, hearing. So are there any additional questions for Mr. Dan? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very so much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to open this up to public comment. I've got a couple speaker cards. So um, if you could, when I call your name, please come forward and state your name and uh, you'll have three minutes to, to make a statement. Uh, the first speaker card I have is Mr. Dan Young. If you could, please come forward. Uh, good morning. My name is Dan Young. Good I'm morning. in uh, Whitfield. I was pleased to hear what this um, amendment was as far as being owner-occupied. That's probably a, a great improvement of this. But I want to touch on a couple of things. Um, to be honest with you, I apologize. I've missed these meetings. I was out of the country, and then I came back. The ball was rolling fairly fast before we actually heard about these things. Um, I would... I would recommend not... Do, I've been a landlord for 40, 50 years. I'm still a landlord. Um, and I know all the pitfalls of landlordship. And um, I'm not sure what the purpose of these things are because you're really taking existing zoning and changing it. I call your attention to TV shows where you see the police running down the backyards and there's houses behind houses and something like that. I think there was a recent shooting on, uh, as someone said, you know, um, you're, you're really altering something that was planned out and, and everything like that. The next question is, what's your justification? How many people need these things? And are they in the neighborhood? Are they really need? I understand. I have one in my house. It's a 1926 carriage house, and you can see what it was. It was a double garage next to another house, driveway in the back. Then someone extended a little further, and that's what I have. And I've got another very large lot. You could easily put one of these things on it. Okay. But I can also say that if I put it on it, um, because I'm in the floodplain, I'd probably go up. I'd be looking down at my neighbor's swimming pool, and I'd, you know, you're sort of packing people together. I've traveled all over the world. I've seen the favelas of Brazil and the, the hutongs of China and the, the, the slums of Cairo, for that matter, and people really can pack themselves together. And I've, I've lived in 110 square feet for a year. I loved it. It was, you know, the food was provided, everything. But... Um, the neighborhoods have a character, and, and this could or could not be disruptive. And you might not be sure what you want to get into. Are there any restrictions on what you're going to build? Uh, I ran a shipping yard. I had containers coming on my ears. I was selling them. Um, they're not, they look good. They're meant for shipping. If you s seal them up, the metal inside, they're going to rust and corrode. They're not going to last. How do you get a 40-foot container out of the backyard that's all corroded and the building inspector says that's good? So, so they're dangerous is what I'm, I'm getting at from a government point of view and from a planning point of view. Um, the, the other final thing is this is, and this is more to a bigger question of affordable housing. You have a healthy housing industry here. These are the guys you should be going after to build more housing that's needed and disperse it. Any place where you concentrate Density, close into a city. And I, I came across something from Syracuse, New York, where I did a study in it 50 years ago. I can't believe it. They're talking about the same thing. It was urban renewal. They tore a section of the city down, then left it there. People went around the university. It's still a danger zone or something like that. So be careful with this. It's a, something that requires a lot of depth of thought, and I hope that's being done. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, just a question or point of clarification. Um, this We previously had this come before the Planning Commission and went to the Board of County Commissioners. Has the version previously been approved, or is this a modification to be approved and adopted? This is a modification to be approved. Okay. So uh, the previous version was not adopted? Is that no, I, I would like to clarify. This has not gone to um, the Board of County Commissioners yet. We took okay. it for a work session in oh, December. Oh, it was a work session. Okay. It came before the Planning Commission in April. It goes to the Board next week. As a entire package? Yes. Okay. And this so. was just a clarification because we made an amendment since April 11th. We wanted 
very public good. comments. Okay, very good. Understood. And uh, I just would like to um, understanding the where it is in the process, I'd like to make the statement <coughs> that again, any citizens who do have strong opinions on this would have the opportunity to speak to the board of county, <coughs> the board of county commissioner. So, thank you. So, um, the next uh, the the next speaker card I have is uh, Mr. Glenn Gibellina. Gibellina, if you would come forward and state your name. <laughs> Good morning. For the record, my name is Glenn Jablina, taxpayer and community activist. Um, I appreciate the gentleman's concern. However, I couldn't. I couldn't disagree with him more. Uh, first of all, we do have a housing crisis here. We're currently tens of thousands of units short and the big developers have not stepped up to the plate, nor will they. There's not enough money in it. Uh, carriage houses, as he owns, has been around forever. Uh, these can look very good. We do 20-foot shipping containers and uh, the cladding. My only concern would be, say, if from the street view, I think you should allow uh, the cladding. You know, there are some architects out there that like to do soy-based closed foam from the inside. They love the Cortan steel. It patinas naturally. And contrary to this gentleman's belief that it's going to rust, these are certified typically 15, 20 years on the high seas, stacked 10 high through typhoons in salt water. They're not going to rust in a backyard of Florida. So I completely disagree with that. Um, that's my, those are my students. We're currently at Bayshore High School. I teach 76 kids how to build homeless containers for homeless students. We currently have 2,000 homeless students and countless vets in Manatee County, and nobody has been stepping up to the plate. These are our future contractors. These are the future answers to what we're doing. So I, uh, we need them. I'm big on incremental development. We're going to approach nonprofits that want to sponsor a vet or homeless student to a residential owner. These are good looking, and by the way, they are movable. We bring a flatbed in and we set them. Uh, <clears throat> I will be speaking to the Manatee County Chamber in 11 days. Feel free to come by Ozark Bank. It'll be in the parking lot. If you want the hands-on touchy feel of this unit, it's beautiful, it's strong, it, it enhances the neighborhood and it solves a huge problem that we have, and that's with the, the homeless students and vets. In addition to, this is, just a, this, this is just a stepping stone for a first responder or school teacher that comes into our community, starts at 44,000 saddled in student debt, and they're coming from a dorm. This is a great alternative till they get on their feet, say $15,000, $10,000 a year. <clears throat> so this is a great, great opportunity uh, Bradington already has it. I'm working with the CRA with them. Uh, Manatee County gives surplus property uh, for affordable housing. So we're moving in the right direction. But if you think the big developers are going to step up to the plate, I've been waiting 20 years for them to do that. They're not going to do it. And it's up to individual nonprofits and small developers like myself that will make the difference. Thank you for this opportunity. And I want to compliment Josh and his team. Super, super great job. A long time coming. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. So those were the uh, two speaker cards I had. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this matter? Anyone at all? Okay. Seeing no one come forward, we're going to close the public comment portion of that uh, application. And uh, uh, what are we being asked to do? Just to uh, approve the m modified version? of the uh, document or the, the document in the entirety? Entirety. Okay, very good, thank you. So um, I'll open it up for discussion, deliberation, any, uh, what's the pleasure of the commission? Uh, I'd like to make a comment. So uh, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of big developers. So we, we talk to apartment guys every day. And I do think there's always several solutions. So I wouldn't disagree that developers can do certain things. Uh, the profit margin today is not there for them to s spend time doing what this does. I also like the idea, and in fact, you can go to certain places like uh, the wharf up in Tampa where they use containers. They've just done a big container village in uh, um, 
the area over there in Narcusi, down in South Orlando, very spectacular, well received. So I'm, I'm a little more interested in the creativity and the uniqueness, and you're going to change character. But I'm going to tell you, if you pull onto the highway, the character's changing. And I, so I think there's some argument that as places get densified, we have to do it in the most appropriate way. I like this idea. I think it is part of, I got two millenniums in my uh, life, and uh, I'd like to put them in a container. So, <laughs> Permanently. But, but I do think that the change is coming, and what we have to try and do is manage it well. So I, I really find this very interesting. I just found out that my architect will try to organize my Amazon home for the neighborhood. So um, mm -hmm. I, I'm just very supportive of this. I think it is the kind of progressive future. And uh, I grew up in South Florida. Things change. And if you don't like that, I moved. So I came here. But I think it's, a, it's something to deal with in a manageable way. And I think that's thoughtful studied recommendations is what we need, so I appreciate that. Good job. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or thoughts? Okay, um, and also just to be clear, this is uh, what we've seen as example is one option. Uh, I think what this does is it provides opportunities for people to come up with creative solutions, and uh, it's not going to be a one, one size fits all. This is only going to be um, something of interest to probably a very narrow band of people, but it, it, it is something that I think uh, uh, is is needed. So, uh, so if there's no other uh, comments or discussion, I'll open it up for a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion. Yes. Based upon the staff report, evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing, and find the request to be consistent with the Mantee County Comprehensive Plan, and in accordance with the criteria for the LDC Tax Amendment and Section 341 of the Land Development Code, as contained herein. I move to recommend adoption of the Mantee County Ordinance 19-02, LDCT-18-05, amending the county the Mantee County Land Development Code as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Any uh, discussion or deliberation? All right. Seeing none, the chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the, uh, the um, regularly scheduled uh, agenda. And the uh, first item we have is the minutes for approval from the May 9th, 2019 hearing. Uh, has everybody had an opportunity to review those? Any, any additions, deletions, corrections? OK, seeing nothing, uh, the chair is going to call the matter to vote. I'll, uh, actually, I guess we need a motion before we can actually vote on something, can't we? <laughs> Make a motion to accept the minutes. <laughs> I have a motion. Is there a second? Close. Second. Second. All right. A motion, a second. Any uh, discussion? Now the chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion passes 6 0. All right. We're going to um, open this up for uh, the, the hearing up for public comment, citizen comment. Again, this is anything that is not on today's agenda. So if if there's anybody who wishes to speak on uh, something that is not on today's agenda, please come forward. If you have some, if you'd like to say something about an application that's going to be heard today, you'll have an opportunity when that application is being heard. So, is there anybody who wishes to come forward and make uh, general comments? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're going to close the citizen comment portion of the hearing and move on to item number three. Item number three, LDCT 18-06. Ms. Barrett, is that one yours? Yes. Okay, could you please introduce item number three into the record? Yes, um, this is LDCT-18-06, Ordinance 1909, a land development code amendment regarding the Coastal High Hazard Overlay District. This is an ordinance the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, amending the official zoning atlas as adopted by reference into Chapter 4, Land Development Code, to update the overlay district map number 45, Coastal High Hazard Overlay District. Um, this is a legislative matter and is county initiated. Um, this is basically um, a housekeeping item. We have the coastal high hazard overlay within the comprehensive plan, the future land use categories, um, and then also as a zoning overlay within the land development code. These, um, the purpose of this is just to make sure that the two match. In 2016, the maps for the coastal high hazard overlay were updated based on information from the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Um, this is just to reflect the changes within the overlay in the zoning. 
So in your packet, you have a map that shows the zoning overlay and the, um, the future land use category overlay. And there is a difference. So this will just bring the two um, to match. Can you uh, briefly explain what the uh, input from the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council was? Um, they provide the information um, on updated studies um, regarding the slosh data. And um, uh, let me get the definition for that. I can find it. Not sure that I did. Oh, thank you. Is that mine? Okay. Um, they provided um, updated information on the slosh, which is the sea, lake, and overland surges from hurricanes. It's a computerized storm surge model. Um, and in 2011, we had the, the last study was done, and the maps um, were based on that study. And then the information was again provided by Tampa Regional Planning Council in 2016. So they have been updated based on that study. Okay. Um, when we did our code revisions in, I think, 20, whenever our last code revisions were, 2017, we updated the definition of the coastal high hazard area to match what's in the comprehensive plan, but we did not change the zoning. So this is just to make sure that both match. If, if I can clarify, if you have a, a property today and it's shown to be in the overlay based on the comprehensive plan, but not based on the zoning, we defer to the comprehensive plan if there's a conflict, because that's the best available data. So this is just merely to make both match. The land development code and the comprehensive plan would match after this were processed? Yes. And can I just ask this then? It says that the report says there's some concern that the change would impact land users or owners, but this says there are no new restrictions or requirements on the properties brought in the overlay district. So what you're saying is there's nobody who has property that now is in this high hazard district has lose some of their rights or controls, right? That's correct. I think people assume because we're making the change that it could impact their property, but today if it's not shown to be in the coastal high hazard area based on your zoning and it is in the comprehensive plan, we defer to the comprehensive plan. Okay. Question? Uh, Mr. Roth. I'm looking at the uh, map. Mm-hmm. Is there a way to tell what was before and what is now? Is that red line indicate what was before? Um, the red line is the zoning overlay. So both will match the green line. The green line or the green land? The green land, which is just colored in. And I can show that on the map. Okay, so where there's an area that was red before, and now there's no green there, what does that mean? Um, let me just pull. Um, I don't know if I can zoom in a little bit. Well, look down below Manatee Avenue West. So here's left hand side. Here's an area right here. The red line shows the zoning overlay. The green shows the future land use. So if you're within this parcel here, based on your zoning overlay, you would not be in the coastal ha hazard area. But you are based on the future land use category. So you are within the coastal high hazard area because that's what the comprehensive plan says and that's what we defer to if there's an inconsistency. We got that. <laughs> Clear. Uh, any, uh, any additional questions for uh, Ms. Mr. Barrett? Chair, if I yes, could just ma indicate so that Analysis has already been done by the Tampa Bay Plan Council, right. required by law to adopt it in the Council Plan and the, and the Community Planning Act. We have a circumstance in our code that we call an overlay zone district, mm -hmm. one of many. Right. And because we call it that, we have to have it on our zoning maps as well. So we're just putting the same map that's already in the Council Plan on the zoning map. Right. And we're required by law to have both those documents to be consistent. So we're just achieving consistency consist consist between the two documents, Comp Plan and LDC. Right, and um, is it is it correct to assume that these two, um, the overlay and the future land use, the the maps from the comprehensive plan, were developed separately and they've kind of merged into a, a single document? Was was the overlay done for a different 
Um, I think originally, years ago, both overlays were done at the same time. It's just unfortunately we amended the comprehensive plan and those were updated and it wasn't followed through and carried through with the zoning. So they have not been consistent. Okay. Do you want to answer questions on stormwater modeling or should Not I really. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gersenberger, um, are these are these models consistent with what the um, what what FEMA utilizes? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, um, Thomas Gersenberger, Public Works Department. I don't necessarily need to be sworn for this one because it's legislative, but. Um, with respect to the modeling associated with the um, future land use category overlay, uh, the slush modeling is a component of modeling that is utilized for the flood insurance rate maps. There are several different models involved in the flood insurance rate maps. Um, those can include river rain, rainfall, and storm surge. So this, yes, this is a component of those flood insurance rate, rate okay. maps. The, the reason I ask this is if a citizen looks to see on the on a, the county uh, map series, if they look to see that they're within a uh, area identified as a coastal high hazard um, area, the f either future land use or zoning, is it are they to presume that they need to then look at the the federal maps? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, uh, with respect to properties and um, coverage within floodplains, things of that sort. The best reference for um, guidance on flood insurance is the flood insurance rate maps. It wouldn't be necessarily the any county maps associated associated with future land use category zoning maps. It is strictly um, for flood insurance policies, uh, for flood coverage, things of that sort. It is through the flood insurance rate maps that are provided by FEMA. Very good. And then uh, just a, somewhat of a follow-up question. Um, are these lines hard, the, the meaning um, the properties within these, are they always going to be in the coastal high hazard area? Or if um, there were to be development and the sites were to be raised, with, could they possibly be raised and removed from the coastal high hazard areas? Mm, Mr. Chair, these particular, um, the latest um, iteration of the slash maps utilized uh, LIDAR topography, used LIDAR contours to generate the uh, delineation of the um, coastal high hazard boundary, which in this case is determined based upon the category one storm surge. So difference in elevation over time, things of that sort that are picked up by later iterations of LIDAR, things of that sort, that line is subject to change. Yes. Okay. It's not a hard and fast boundary. It's it's subject to the elevation of the site. Correct. Okay. Yes. Mr. Rutledge. And, and kind of following up on that, so I just recently read that the uh, Storm Irma changed the contour of some of the uh, flats and changed the solidity of the water there and changed the habitats and so forth. And so, so these would be then reviewed as whatever regular time frame is reviewed by the Tampa Bay Regional group, we would then review it as well. So they're taking into account because obviously those depths and salinity, all those other things have some impact on how this contour is developed, right? Concur. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Any additional questions? Okay. Um, Lisa, did you have any additional information? Okay. I'm going to open it up for public comment. Thank you. So is there uh, anybody who wishes to come forward and speak on this item? Anybody in the audience? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're going to close the public comment portion of the uh, of the hearing. And um, are there any additional questions, comments, concerns that staff can address? Okay, chair will uh, consider a motion. Anyone? Anyone at all? Make a motion uh, based upon the staff reports. Ev evidence were re presented. Comments made at the public hearing and finding the request be consistent with the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan in accordance with Section 341 of the Land Development Code. I move to recommend the adoption of the Ordinance 19-09, amending the Manatee County Land Development Code as recommended by staff. We have a motion. Is there a second? second. Mr. Ross, second. Uh, any discussion? Okay. Chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you.
All right, the next item we have is item number four. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, item number four is a, uh, <coughs> a quasi-judicial um, application. So um, if you intend to speak... <coughs> If you intend to speak on this item or any other item uh, remaining on today's agenda, please um, rise to be sworn in. If you don't do it now, you're going to have to do it later. Declare <laughs> or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate. I do. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Margaret Tusing with Building and Development Services. This is item number four on the agenda. It's PDC 1826 ZP Convenience Store and Gas Station at US 301 and Fort Hamer Road. This is a quasi judicial hearing, and Dorothy Rainey is the planner. This is a rezone of 2.99 acres from the Suburban Agriculture North Central Overlay District to the planned development commercial zoning district retaining the north central overlay. It is also the approval of a preliminary site plan for 4,649 square feet convenience store, 18 fuel pump stations, and 980 square feet of a freestanding car wash and associated infrastructure. It is located at the northwest corner of US 301 and Fort Hamer Road in Parrish. Uh, Dorothy Rainey is present for presentation for staff as well as the applicant's representative. Very good. Uh, for the commissioners, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? None. Okay, seeing none disclosed. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the uh, uh, applicant presentation. Who do we have for the applicant? Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Huff. If you could please state your name and that you have been sworn. Good morning, Commissioners. I am Marla Huff, and I've been sworn. Also with me here today is Bill Lloyd and Bob Brett of RKM Development Corporation. And, and uh, he's the developer of the property. He's happy to finally be doing one near where he lives in Parrish. <laughs> we are pretty... Uh, we are proposing a rezone from A1 to PDC for a 4,629 square foot convenience store with 18 gas pumps and a 980 square foot automated car wash at the northwest corner of US 301 North and future Fort Hamer Road in Parrish. The proposed floor area ratio is 0 0.04 compared to an allowed FAR of 0.23. To the south of the project is US 301, an arterial roadway, and to the east is future Fort Hamer Road, which is also an arterial roadway. Recent changes have occurred to nearby properties. Specifically, the dollar store was constructed to the east in 2014, and a dentist office is currently under construction east of 121st Street East. That project is nearing completion. The project is located in the North, North Central Overlay District, which requires 20% open space minimum, and we have 52% open space provided. The proposed change will not adversely affect traffic congestion, as the use has a 66% bypass rate, so only 34% of the site trips will be new trips. Although concurrency is being deferred for this process, a detailed traffic impact analysis has been submitted with the final site plan. The developer executed an at-risk form accepting the risk of undertaking the FSP process concurrently with this rezone process. We are requesting three special approvals as outlined in your board package. The first pertains to LDC 531.10D and the car wash structure. We are asking to reduce the required setback from 10 feet by 10 feet from 35 feet to 25 feet along the west property line in the proximity of the automated car wash. The existing adjacent zoning to the west is A1 and it contains a single family residential structure approximately 232 feet west of the property line. The aerial photo display shows there are multiple structures and vehicles, not just passenger vehicles, but some large trailers on the site to the west. 
which gives the impression that the residence is also operating as a business. The closest structure to the site is an open air pole barn structure with agriculture equipment stored in it, which is located 145 feet west of the property line. The reduction of the setback is necessary to avoid design issues with the FDOT required improvements along US 301 in our D-cell lanes. If we were to have to shift it to provide that amount, the driveway would end up right in the middle of an existing drainage in inlet and cross drain pipe. The proposed 210 lineal feet of six foot high opaque fence on the west property line combined with the FDOT constraint and business nature of the adjacent project in conjunction with the large distance to the residential structure mitigates sufficiently for the requested 10 foot uh, setback reduction. The second pertains to the LDC 531.16A, the vehicular stacking area of the drive stack for the car wash. The vehicular stacking and is kind of a, you know if you went to a gas station and a car wash, there, aren't, you, there isn't usually a line. It's, they just, uh, the code applies the same thing to an, an ancillary uh, car wash as they do to a full-time one. But anyways, um, we're asking, we have slightly less than the 30-foot required on the west adjacent property line, specifically 26.77 and 24.5 feet. The proposed six-foot high opaque fence on the property line, the FDOT constraint, the business nature of the adjacent property, and the large distance to the residential structure mitigate sufficiently for the car wash drive-through being placed 3.23 to 5.5 foot closer to the property line than the LDC requires. The third is pertains to LDC 531.16B, which requires landscaping be placed on the outside of the fence. We are requesting that the plantings be placed on the inside of the fence so the plantings can be maintained without trespassing on the neighbor's property. I also want to show you a few photos from the site so you can just kind of get a feel for the area. The photos show there is extensive vegetation and trees along the west property line and the FSP landscape plans propose to preserve most of the existing trees along that property line. This will act as a great buffer both from a visual and noise perspective. Here's another photo. We are agreeable with the, pro with the um, stipulations proposed by staff and ask for your approval on this project. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, with regard to the uh, interaction with the neighbor, have there been discussions and uh, do you have anything that uh, acknowledges their um, agreement with uh, some there, of these reductions? There haven't been discussions. Um, they were noticed. Um, they were in the mail out notification area. I didn't, we had one out of 17 come back and it wasn't from them, one because it was an address that no longer was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also, there was also the legal advertisement in the paper as required. Okay. Probably have some additional questions on that, but let's uh, go ahead and uh, any uh, questions for the applicant? Anything? Okay. We'll go ahead and go to the uh, staff presentation. Good morning. Dorothy Rainey, planner for staff, and I have been sworn. Um, my presentation will be very brief and probably has already been covered. However, <laughs> I'll go forward with it. Um, the request is a convenience store and gas station at US 301 and Fort Hamer Road. The future land use category is UF3 or urban fringe, three units per acre. The zoning is A1, suburban agriculture. Uh, aerial of the site um, zoomed in to the on the left side. It, all, it shows the, I believe that's the center line for the Fort Hamer Road that will be coming through there. Next slide. Um, so the information, it's a 2.99 acre site. Um, it was originally part of a larger uh, parcel that the county acquired the east half, or more than half, um, for the Fort Hamer Road, right for the right-of-way as well as the stormwater ponds. It's in the A1 North Central Overlay Zoning. Um, you have three future land uses, I mentioned. Um, next slide. 
uh, the request is to rezone the 2.99 acres from A1 to plan development commercial, retaining the north central overlay, and for a preliminary site plan for the convenience store, car wash, gas pumps, and associated infrastructure, as well as um, request for three specific approvals, as the applicant mentioned. Um, the one is to um, reduce by 10 feet the setback from the west property line for the actual car wash structure. Um, the second one is for the drive-through lane itself to be set back um, a reduction from 30 feet to 24 and a half feet. And then the third one is to allow landscaping that's required normally on the outside of the fence or wall to be placed on the inside for ease of um, access for, uh, for maintenance. Um, the first two requests, as the applicant mentioned, are actually for the roadway design um, that FDOT has already uh, provided, you know, so that they um, can fit in with and um, uh, construct the site um, in accordance with what they've already been told is going to be going in there. Um, the surrounding uses to the north and west, there are single family residences with appears to be agricultural uses going on in A zone, A1 zoning. To the south across US 301 is vacant property zoned A1, north central overlay. And then to the east is the county owned property to be developed with the Fort Hamer Road extension as well as associated stormwater facilities. This is a color rendering of the site. Um, next slide. Um, the access points onto, are onto US 301 and Fort Hamer Road, and they're both right in, right out access points. The convenience store building, the car wash building, and the gas pump and canopy are shown on there. There's parking around three sides of the building and at the northeast of the parking lot, and the stormwater pond is at the north end of the site. The positives are that the site is located at a commercial node, which is appropriate for commercial and retail development. It does have frontage on both US 301 and Fort Hamer Road that are both arterials. The negatives are it abuts single family residences to the north and west, and there may be potential negative impacts relative to lights, glare, noise to these residences. Um, the mitigating measures would be a lighting plan, of course, will be required to be in compliance with the land development code at the final site plan stage. The site provides buffers and screening that meet or exceed the minimum LDC adjacent to residential development. And we recommend approval of the rezone, the preliminary site plan, and the three specific approvals with the stipulations provided. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions? Um, yes, with regard to the uh, reduction and the setback from the western property mm -hmm. edge, has uh, staff had any conversation with the neighbor? The neighbor? No, no. Generally, when I when I look at uh, rezones, I, I look at it as establishing rights within the property. And when we do reductions, it affects the uh, uh, an adjacent property. And um, right. I would I would think that there would, somebody would reach out to the neighbor and at least have a discussion and uh, seek endorsement. But um, I think normally that that could be something that's covered if if they if the applicant does a neighborhood meeting. Mm -hmm. But and or if they contact us, the neighbor and right. nobody's contacted us from any of the surrounding properties. And uh, the I think in the intent to mitigate that reduction was to uh, provide. It says a fence. Is it well, truly a fence or a wall? That is a requirement. Of a six foot uh, fence or wall, opaque fence or wall, is always required. Um, in this case, it's required, and the landscaping is normally required to be on the outside, but for ease of access to maintain it. They're asking that specific approval um, to be granted to allow it on the inside. Um, it, you know, it's re reducing the distance. However, as the applicant mentioned, the residence structure is at least 232 feet away. So that little reduction and still having that, that solid wall and landscaping, it, you know, it's still gonna do the same as far as screening, um, screening both noise and visual, so. How is this different from any other buffer that would have a fence or wall in it? Typically, they're placed uh, inboard of the buffer and allowing... Uh, well, the, this, um, this particular fence or wall uh, requirement with landscaping is um, as a result of um, meeting criteria for specific use um, for a, a car wash, uh, a car wash with a drive-through. It's the drive-through component, um, 531.2. I believe it's one six um, that for specific uses that contain drive-through facilities have to provide the solid fence or wall with landscaping. No, my, my question is related to the landscaping. Uh, typically, landscaping is put on the outside of 
any, any fence or wall to right. uh, the buffering's done for the neighbor, not for the the site. Right. So how is this different? Why would why would it be allowed to put uh, fencing on the inside to meet meet the criteria? Well, I mean, uh, right, landscaping. because they have they, they don't all they're not always required to do the fence or wall, uh, but in this case they are, and if they place the landscaping on the outside. They have to trespass onto the a neighbor's property to access it. If, if the fence were inboard and the landscape yeah, would be on were the inside their buffer, uh, yeah. how is that tres trespassing? I, I don't see the difference between this one and, and a lot of the, the typical, so I'm trying to understand why this is different. Yeah, well, like I said, normally it's on the outside, but if they, um, you know, if they have an issue with access, which in this case they're saying they, they will if they provide that wall there. Hmm. Then they're you know they're asking for it to be on the inside right. to avoid that conflict or that problem. Okay, Mr. Canabel, I see you uh, <laughs> queuing up. Hi, Robert Canabel. I'm uh, section manager, environmental review. Um, and in some cases, you know, we we allow them to put the landscape on the inside when it when it is going to be a maintenance issue. Mm -hmm. um, We've had situations where the say I don't know about this case specifically, but we've had we've had situations where say neighbors have fences up to the property line. It just makes it real difficult to get in there to do maintenance. So, so generally, if they request it and they give us a reason why the maintenance would be easier to do it on the inside, we've allowed that. Right. And has there been a compelling reason given for this one? Is there a fence there? Uh, I haven't heard anything yet that would lead me to believe that there would be a maintenance issue. It's just if you place the fence along the property boundary, you're going to have an issue. But if you place a fence or wall uh, within the inboard side of the, the buffer, it, it would uh, likely still have access. I would, I would defer that to, to Marla, to the, okay. to the applicant. All right. right. We'll, we'll ask uh, the applicant that. Um, any additional questions for Mr. Mr. Ron? Uh, one real quick question. Um, when's the Fort Hammer extension coming through? Is there a timeline on that yet? Um, I don't know, but maybe Clark can <laughs> answer that or, or Tom. They're more knowledgeable of the. Good morning for the record. Clark Davis, interim deputy director of public works traffic management, and I have been sworn. The Adjacent segment of Fort Hammer is what we call segment C. It was part of an agreement where the Fort Hammer from Moccasin Walla Road all the way down to 301 was going to be uh, built. Uh, the portion that will be completed this year is north of here. It's the piece that connects from Erie down to the high school entrance. This is part of the next section south of that. We call it segment C. It is still under design and an acquisition, but when that's complete, uh, we'll be able to start setting a construction time frame. But I think it's realistic for it to start next year. Okay. And um, um, If I can jump in just for a quick second. Uh, for the record, Thomas Gersmer, Public Works Department, and I actually just pulled up an email from the project manager on for segment C of Four Hammer Road Extension, who happens to be Michael Sturm. Um, and based upon uh, one of his latest uh, email correspondence that I received from him, um, construction should take place within the next two years on segment C. Thank good. you. Very good. Any additional questions for staff? Mr. Yeah. Roth. When we send out a letter to a butters as a general question, how far in advance of this hearing would it be? You're, t you're referring to the notices to the property owners within 500 feet. Um, I believe it's like two weeks prior to hearing. It's ten, minimum requirement is 10 days notice. Okay. okay. Second it's question. It's usually sent out earlier than that. Okay. Second question is, are they, do we require a return receipt requested? No, we do not. The applicant submits an affidavit stating that they mailed it on the correct date and they attach the mailing notice list. Okay. And they post it, right? The land has a posting on there that the zoning meeting yeah, is occurring? Yeah, there's multiple. There's a sign on the property. There's the mailing, individual mailing notice, and then an advertisement in the newspaper. Okay. So my next question is, to the south on the other side of 301, there's some land. Do you know what's going there? Um, it is in with an application. It's called Fort Hamer Crossing, and it's also wanting to rezone to plan development commercial with a preliminary site plan for for um, shopping. I believe it's a preliminary for a variety of retail commercial uses and possibly a gas station okay. as well. Yeah, I, I've seen that plan. 
So my next question is, do we have a planned traffic light at this corner? Clark. <laughs> when the county constructed the realignment of uh, Fort Hammer Road to meet where you see it on the south side, a traffic signal was installed at that location. So it's signalized today. The main change that will occur is that Fort Hammer on the south side will let's say be straightened out a little bit more to meet and cross and align with Fort Hammer. 121st will be terminated in a cul-de-sac north of the intersection. So there'll be some changes to the configuration, but it will remain a f essentially a four-way or a four-leg intersection, as we call it. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Davis, when um, as these uh, properties in that that intersection um, develop, there be continued continued monitoring by DOT and any necessary improvements from the impacted development. Those um, those uh, impacts are they going to be bore by the developers by the by the county or will DOT bear those improvements? What we've seen so far for the developments coming in this area is that we still have enough capacity on the thoroughfare roadways that we've not had off-site concurrency related improvements. I believe for this location they've got um, proposed access on both um, 301 and Fort Hammer and so the 301 improvements would be permitted through the state. It's likely they would need a turn lane into it and they would work with the state on those required improvements. They would be, The re developer would be responsible for those. Um, they may get ahead of the county in terms of when they build their connection or what will become the connection to Fort Hammer extended. In that case, some of that work may be done by the county as we do the road project, but we can work with the developer on that depending on when they get through their final site plan approval. But that's a site-related improvement, so it's about how their sidewalk ties into the road sidewalk and how their driveway connects to the road as well. Um, but the We've been designing it because that's so close to the intersection uh, in anticipation of a right in, right out access being allowed at that location. So again, it would be similar in terms of improvements, say a right turn in, a right turn lane, a deceleration lane into the property that would be built by either county or applicant, depending on timing. Very good, thank you. All right, anything else for staff? Uh, Ms. Rainey, just one last question or uh, confirmation um, staffs and again staffs in approval with the I mean uh, in agreement with the specific approvals that were being requested yes okay yes, just want to make sure that mm -hmm. even though I quizzed you on it I, that it, that was clear <laughs> yes, one question uh, mr. Uh, Rutledge. Rutledge. Yeah. I don't know I'm right. my last one okay yeah. I, I there's something that the applicant said I want you to tell me you concur and that is that their obligation is to have a 20% green space, and they said they're going to have 52%. Do you agree? Do you believe that? They usually provide the calculations, and, and they identify Defense. at final site plan that they're meeting the minimum 20% and that their minimum is being met by no more than 75% of that would be in water bodies or wetlands. There's no wetlands on the site, of course, so um, they're they're providing quite a bit around the stormwater pond and you know to the north on the north end of the site so they're going to be required to demonstrate all that with the final site plan Th this is more their intent to meet the requirement and of course we won't approve the final site plan unless they meet it so yeah just because that's pretty important i mean I i'm sure you didn't just flippantly say that so but but my analysis is if you can have people do twice as much or a significant Delta in that, and they asked for a, a modification on where they put their bushes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not having a difficult time kind of agreeing to that. And I just want to be sure when people say that, that when they do their final site plan, that we can expect that. Because that's, that's a pretty significant benefit, I think. If we could right. cut everybody's development amount down in half, uh, I'm kind of a fan of that, despite liking mm -hmm. modular homes. And I would um, point out that, you know, they are providing the – the entire 50-foot roadway buffer, both on US 301 and Fort Hamer, so that adds quite a bit. Normally, commercial projects have asked for a reduction for commercial it. roadway buffers uh, to go down to 25 feet, so that, that's quite a good amount of the open space. And, and in your expert in opinion and experience, would you argue with the south corner going commercial and this corner going commercial that the next-door neighbor who has some kind of conduct, whatever that may be, uh, 
might be enticed at some time in the future to go commercial as well and move on? I mean, isn't that kind of the practice we see? Yeah, yeah, I've seen like with another project that's um, coming forward in another month or so um, that you know the the neighbors that were noticed they were like, well, what could I have gone on that comp plan amendment or <laughs> can I know, what, that yeah, too? Yeah. yeah, if they're if they're meeting the commercial locational criteria, they're within 1,500 feet, I believe. Um, at least 75 percent, I believe, of their frontage has to be within the 1,500 feet of the intersection. Then they they may also um, this has qualify. an inducement in zoning to yeah they, economic inducement yeah I mean especially with the Fort Hamer coming through all of a sudden it's like you know you may not want to live on a I believe it's going to be a four lane um, road I, I think that's kind of thing is that if you look into the future a little bit uh, maybe it's a year or two whatever it's probably unlikely this corner looks like it does today so right just, unfortunately these yeah, changes change. to me are not very problematic based on some of the stuff oh, I yes. see, so. okay thank you I, mm -hmm. I think everybody agrees the nature's changing of this intersection so Wait, <laughs> let me write that down <laughs> all right thank you very much um all right we're gonna open this up for um uh, comments from the public so is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this application Anyone at all? If you could uh, state your name and that you have been sworn. My name is Glenn Jabalina. Unfortunately, I have not been sworn. So oh, there's always sworn. one. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't going to be here that long. Trial affirmed that the factual statements and factual representations that you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the fence buffer. The whole idea of that is to the aesthetics for the neighbor, not for the customers. So I would proffer that if they, and it's 176 feet away, if they want to pull in the fence three feet and put the landscaping on the outside, that benefits the neighbor, that benefits everyone that's driving down that road that doesn't have to look at a six foot stark fence. If maintenance is an issue, Spend 200 bucks, put in a locking three-foot fence, walk outside, the, walk, walk outside the fence, and water it. Do drip irrigation. I don't buy that. It's a maintenance issue. I have a hard time swallowing that. The second thing, if they want to put it on the inside, it enhances the aesthetics of their customers. If they really want to do the right thing, they should do it on both sides, and then everybody would be happy. But I don't think, because if you open that door that, oh, we don't have to put it on the outside anymore, now you've almost set case law that, oh, they did it at the gas station, so we're entitled to it. I think it sets, sends a bad message. I, I, I think it's going to come back and, and bite you if you allow this to happen for, for not a good reason. And this is not a good reason. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and uh, make a comment? If you would, just come forward. And again, uh, you must be sworn. So if you could, please come forward, state your name, and that you have been sworn. I haven't been sworn. My name is Andy Branco, and I'm listening to this. So if, if there's anybody else who wishes to make a comment on any application that's going to be heard, please rise to be sworn, or you're going to have to be sworn prior to speaking. Okay. All right. Okay. If you would, please, uh, you need to be sworn before you make a statement. We're from that the factual statements and factual representations which you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate. I do. Thank you. I intend to agree with the last gentleman that spoke. I think that the uh, Planning Commission should be looking out for the interests of the people who are the current property owners. If they can't fit their property within the zoning requirements and the setback requirements, why should you jump on the little guy? I uh, agree with his analysis of what they should do. I would think that they would sh should adjust their plan, their layout plan for the property so that they're in con in conformity what the requirements were for the set setbacks. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, anybody else who wishes to come forward? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one else come forward, we're gonna close the public comment portion of the hearing and we're gonna move on to the uh, uh, staff closing comments. So uh, does staff have any closing comments? Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to mention that the um, the fence or wall is is going to be on the west property line. It it won't be visible um, without landscaping to the public driving by, as the gentleman had alluded to, that he didn't want to drive by and see just the bare wall. 
if we allow the landscaping on the inside, but that's running along the you know west property line. Um, also, um, the applicant indicated that there there was going to be an attempt to save some of the existing trees on that property, so that was partly why they're wanting to put the wall where they requested um, that it would facilitate preser preservation of some of the trees there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was all I was. Uh, just so I understand, you're saying the wall is going to have landscape on one side, but the other side is going to be bare. That would be the side that yeah, you'd along see. the west property line. Um, that's where the part of the reason they want to move the wall to the outside and have their required landscaping on the inside is that it would interfere with preservation of some of the trees that are along that west right. property. No, line. that's not what I'm asking. You oh. said that the wall would not be visible because vegetation. No, from, from the road. The, the first gentleman that spoke from mm -hmm. the uh, public um, mentioned he didn't want to drive by and see a bare wall um, or fence. Mm -hmm. But you really won't see it. I mean, you might see it through the neighbor to the west's property, mm -hmm. possibly, as you're coming northward. Uh -huh. um, but there's also going to be trees and landscaping, or actually there's existing, I believe, uh, vegetation on the west. So, Western property. Okay, well. so the the, the existing uh, the neighbor's side has existing vegetation that would. I believe it that. does. It's it's okay. hard to tell because the property appraiser um, pr parcel boundaries are shifted a bit, but I believe there may be um, some landscape. I mean, some existing vegetation on their property. Um, yeah, it's it's shifted quite a bit <laughs> on the aerials that we have. Okay, but. all right. It, that was just a little bit of a confusing statement. So, okay. Sorry. thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any questions for staff? I th think we've beat that buffer to death. Yep. Okay, all right. Um, we have, uh, uh, now we can uh, have the uh, applicant rebuttal. Okay, where'd all my just um, exhibits all right. go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I still need them. This is the area we're proposing the fence in. This is where the residence is. It's in this area. And the reason, besides maintenance, is yes, we're trying to save. There are a lot of very nice trees out there, oak trees. This is looking east at the west property line on the south end. This is looking east at the west property line in the middle of the site. And well, th that doesn't matter. Those are the areas where we're trying to preserve trees. Now, if we just come through here and put a fence up so that we can do everything like everything's normally done, we're going to kill some of the nice trees we're trying to preserve in there. They're oak trees. But, you know, we can do it. But that was, I've always felt like an existing mature tree is a much better uh, buffer for noise, and it's much more visually attractive than a brand new tree planted. So do what you will with it, but that was, you know, more so than the maintenance, but maintenance is also a factor. And, uh, Ms. Huff, uh, some of those larger trees are also on the neighbor's property, is that true? No. They're, they're all they're on? Basically, their property is naked. Okay. <laughs> and if you look at it, look, it's just like the only thing on their property is the um, canopy of our trees. Okay. But yeah, it's a very burly um, property line, which is nice for mm -hmm. buffering for the neighbors. <clears throat> ask her oh, a Mr. Rutledge. Uh, can I just ask you a question? So I've had this experience where you're quote, going to save the trees, and the challenge a little bit is the configuration of the land and so forth doesn't really provide for that. You know, you have to build boxes and differentials and w elevations and so forth. So is your assessment of those trees, is there valuable and can be saved? Yes, correct. And like I said, see, we've gone past this stage. We're already doing the final site plans. Gotcha. My landscape yes. architect has already um, laid out plans. He's identified what we're going to preserve. And we're, okay. that's our best opportunity for preserving trees is along that west property. A lot, okay. a lot of the other areas of the site, you know, we're having to kill them we're having to replace as many as we can on site but we've had to do some off-site too because they didn't all fit sure. but that area was you know the the part where we were able to leave it most untouched this is why we 
like our staff because they think of all these things for us. <laughs> yeah, we've already been we're we're ready to do our second resubmittal on the final site plan, so we we really know what we're going to have. <laughs> Understood. Very good. Uh, was that the uh, conclusion of your rebuttal? That was the only thing because that I mean that was the only thing that was thrown out. Is, mm -hmm. Do we do the buffer reduction or or put allow the landscaping on the other side or not? I mean, everything else seemed non-controversial. And you're affirming the fifty percent. Because you've oh, done absolutely, and, and like Dorothy said, when you put a 50-foot roadway buffer in there, that's a lot, and then we've got a dry stormwater pond, you know, okay. all of that together, it, it adds up. It's 52%. Those are the numbers. I have a question. Mr. Roth. The cuts to get into the property. Road, roadway cut? Roadway cut. So is there going to be a cut on 301? Yes, and we're working with FDOT, and we're going to be putting in a right-turn desail lane. We have a right-in only, okay. right-in, right-out. How about on Fort Hamer? There's one on the northern end, right-in, right-out, because they're all, you know, both the four-lane divided, so right. you can't do any lefts. Good enough. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. So we're going to close the testimony uh, portion of the hearing and move to deliberation. I, I'd just like to say... Uh, uh, Again, I, I view um, zoning um, proceedings as establishing rights, and uh, typically they're with on the prop with on the property. And but we do have interactions with neighbors, so um, there's probably uh, there's two options or two uh, reasons the neighbors may not uh, be here or may not have made uh, comment. Is one they don't care. That's very likely that they don't care about this. And number two is uh, that they may not be aware, and I find that hard to believe since they've been noticed and there's signs out there, obviously. So, um, uh, and again, I, I think uh, with the proceedings, we have to be cautious and make sure that they're evaluated. Um, I, I would uh, advise that when this goes in front of the Board of County Commissioners, maybe you emphasize the fact that there are large trees, and one of the things that, uh, one of the mitigating factors is the preservation of trees. So I think it's... Uh, that's uh, an important consideration. I just wanted to make those just few comments. And again, 301, and uh, we have a state road and a future four-lane road. I think this is uh, the right place for something like this. So. Any other uh, co comments? I agree. Deliberation. Nothing else? All right. Chair will uh, entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion. Based upon the staff report, evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing, and finding the request to be consistent with the Mantee County Comprehensive Plan and the Mantee County Land Development Code as conditioned herein, I move, I move to recommend approval of Mantee County Zoning Ordinance Number PDC 1826ZP as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Roth, second. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, the chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6 0. All right, we're going to move on to item number five. Ms. Tusing, can you please read item number five into the record? Yes, item number five is PDMU 0680GR3, Lakewood Center, I mean, excuse me, Lakewood Ranch Commerce Park. This is a quasi judicial hearing, and Rosina Leiter is the planner. This is amending the zoning ordinance number PDMU 0680GR2 to amend a general development plan to remove 30.07 acres from the boundaries of the project for a total development area of 250.54 acres. Acres, maintaining the previously approved entitlements, 248,000 square feet of commercial space, 228,300 square feet of office space, and 882,000 square feet of industrial space. It's also having a schedule of uses, which was voluntarily proffered by the applicant, and is generally located south of State Road 64 East on the east and west sides of Lakewood Ranch Boulevard, and north and south of Gatewood Drive in Bradenton. Uh, the applicant's representatives are here as well as Ms. Leiter for presentation. Very good. Thank you. And again, uh, for the commissioners, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No, sir. No. Okay. Seeing none disclosed, we're going to move forward. Um, who do we have for the applicant? Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Danielle Ellis, and I have been sworn. Thank you. <laughs> 
great start. <laughs> Always. <laughs> um, I'm a planner with the law firm of Grimes Goble, and today I also have with me Mr. Caleb Grimes from our office. As Ms. Tusing mentioned, this is an amendment um, to the general development plan that was approved in 2007 for 280 acres of mixed-use project. We are requesting to remove 30.07 acres from the project boundary. This is an isolated area separated from the um, industrial park that is south of Gatewood Drive. Get to it. There's the aerial. There, um, as Ms. Susing also mentioned, there is no change to the entitlements, the um, dimensional standards, open space, the wetland buffers, the wetland acreage. Um, this is just removing 30 acres of upland area. The wetland, um, and I know um, a few of the citizens had, had questions about the wetland acreage. It is preserved. It remains at about 44 acres. Um, nothing, again, is changing with that. Open space required for this project is 20%, and it is done by a lot by lot review. So every site plan that comes in has to provide 20% open space to make sure that's being met. So with this removal of all upland, the open space will actually increase. Um, we were approved in 2016 to add additional square footage for industrial. So the overall entitlements for the land is around 1.3 million square feet of office, commercial, and industrial. The FAR before the removal of the 30 acres is at 0.11. Um, and with the removal of the 30 acres, it increased very insignificantly to 0.12. Um, the overall FAR allowed under the future land use categories in this uh, development. We have IL, which allows for an FAR of 0.75, and that is for the industrial light portion that is located on the so southern portion of the project. Um, the northern portion has the retail office residential um, future land use, which has an increased FAR from the um, August 20. 18 um, comp plan updates. They increased the FAR from 0.35 to 0.50 and 0.1 for mixed use project, or sorry, 1.0 for mixed use projects. So the FAR has actually increased for the future land use category. Um, and as you could see at 1.2 for the overall project FAR, we are well below our lowest maximum at 1.5, or sorry, 0.5. Um, the overall development, um, over half of the project has been developed. There are about 400,000 square feet of commercial office and industrial left. There are very few vacant parcels remaining in this project. It is very close to build out. And again, the request for this project is one request to remove that 30 acres, which you will see come before you on July 11th, which um, the request will be to incorporate that into the neighboring Lakewood Center DRI. Um, that was the one, the two items after this that were continued to the July agenda. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. This one is pretty straightforward with just the removal of that upland area. Again, to, to be perfectly clear, all we're being asked to do today is to consider removing that from... That is correct. The, uh, from the DRI boundary, the DRI. or the GDP boundary, which will at a later point be included in a DRI boundary. Right. So it's just the removal of the land today. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Any uh, questions for the applicant? Where exactly in this yellow? Um, let me go to, or let me go to the next slide. The um, yellow area highlighted on the presentation in front of you, that is the 30 acres that is currently in the boundary that we're asking for removal. Um, and you will see that to the 
east, there is a tiny little sliver that is also coming out that is not part of the wetland system, but it is an area that is heavily treed. It is adjacent to the Bob Gardner Dog Park. Um, and I have confirmed with the landowner that that little sliver will eventually go to the Lakewood Ranch Stewardship District and it will not be developed. I mean, there's no access to it. The only access to that area is via sidewalk, so. Very good, thank you. Any, uh, yeah, and the future planning then for that space is gonna be an apartment complex, is that correct? Um, it is uh, residential, that is the plan. But again, that's not the application right, before. Correct. So that'll that, that's what will come before you on July 11th. Right. Stay tuned. Yes, and this did just recently go through a comp plan amendment. It was, um, the future land use category was industrial light. There were um, industrial entitlements on this 30 acres. Last week on the um, board hearing, it was adopted to change the future land use of this site to mixed use residential. Okay. Could I ask? Another question? Sure. <laughs> so if you cross the road on the south, there's a little diagonal area and a road, and then there's a large area that's owned by SMR. Do we have any idea what that's going to be in the future? Again, uh, that, an idea of yeah, it, again, that's not relevant to this application. It'd probably be interesting information if uh, by chance. The Is it, uh, are you talking um, the area north of Gatewood Drive, up in the middle of the project? I can't oh. point to We're it. Talking but. south, where all you see is land. Lakewood Ranch Boulevard is on the left. 44th Avenue is south. It's a large area of acreage owned by SMR. I don't, I don't think it's on the aerial. Um, yeah, let me pull up. Let me pull up the site plan map. Do you have it? Oh, is there the aerial? I don't know which. One. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, uh, this doesn't show it either. Um, the, par the parcel you're talking about, it is not on this map in front of us, correct? I think the rules should be if it's not on the map, yeah. we can't talk about it's it. Part of the <laughs> well, yeah. it is on this map. It's on the map that's here. That's the staff map. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. it on the map that's on the overhead? It's ju just below your finger. Just below your finger. You're not showing oh. it. That's all right. Skip it. That is part of the Lakewood Center DRI, which we could discuss on July 11th. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, very, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very good. Uh, any additional yeah. questions for uh, the applicant? Humanity planning board. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I think it's now uh, staff's opportunity for a presentation. <laughs> Good morning, Rosina Leider, and has been sworn. I confirm that uh, the information that the applicant provides is correct. The request is to remove 30 acres for the existing boundaries of the Lakewood Ranch Commons Park and reduce the total area for from 280 acres to 250 acres and maintain the entitlements, the existing entitlements, uh, and um, the schedule of uses that was approved in 2016. Uh, if you see this um, area, the area in yellow is the area that's going to be removed from the project area. And is right now showing the entire um, approved boundaries. And uh, I have the history that she already talked about. This project was originally approved in 1995 and has been subject to many changes. And at some point was approved for 2 million square feet of mixed uses. And right now the entitlements are for uh, 1,300 square feet of mixed uses, industrial, commercial, and offices, and has an existing CLOS. Um, this is the area that she already showed with the area that um, I cannot point, but it's the area to the south. This is the zoning, the uh, plan is on PDMU, and is within two future land use category, ROR and IL. And if you see the arrow is the area that is subject to be removed that uh, was uh, recently changed the future land use category to MUCR. And uh, we are waiting for the final <coughs> documents to change Please. the plan. And uh, no changes to the previous um, future land, um, floor area ratios or open space or entitlements, like I said. 
and I confirmed that previously, before the, uh, actually, the flow area ratio is 0 .12, uh, 0.11 and going to be 0 0.12 with this removal. And that's it. I, uh, I don't have any particular issues. And I confirmed that the areas that are to the east of the project are conservation areas that has been platted with the Arbor Grande and are not subject to be changed or touched with this application or any other application. Very good. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions for staff? Thank you very much. Okay. All right, we're going to go to the uh, public comment portion of the hearing. I've got two speaker cards. Um, I'll call your name, and if you could, please come up and state your name and that you have been sworn. The first speaker card I have is Mr. David Smith. Good morning. Good morning. I'm David Smith. Uh, I live on the adjacent property, and I have been sworn. Thank you. So I'm I'm new to this sort of stuff. Uh, I've never been involved with the planning commissioner commission like yourself. So some of this Sorry. is new, and I'll try to get through my three minutes as best as I can. I first learned of this on Saturday uh, this past week. I received this here notice in the mail, which you, you guys are probably familiar with. And I got page two here. So I guess that's a notice that adjacent landowners get. Mm -hmm. And I also got this map right here. So it's, I don't know, in some regards, this map is better than the one that y'all have. But I was under the impression that, that this was the zoning meeting for adding the 235 apartment units in this 30-acre section, which... I guess I have to come back on July 11th uh, yes, to talk about that. Right. Um, and I have a I have a whole list of reasons why I don't think this apartment complex should be adjacent to my property, and, and I'll come back on the 11th to talk about that. But what I what I can ask is, after this plot here was approved in 2016. Why would we be going back to redo it again today? That's when I'd ask the applicants. And it's pretty clear to me the only reason why is to build this air apartment complex, high density apartment complex, adjacent to the wetlands and whatnot. But that's that's really my question today. And I'll be back on the eleventh, but mm -hmm. that's what I'd like to know. Okay. Very we just good. approved this two years ago. Right. Or less than three years ago. Right. Actually, this property has been um, modified and changed since '95, so it's it's it has a long history. The la the most recent one was two years ago. So this right. this you know being a master plan community, there was a lot of uh, effort and action taken. And again, uh, there were multiple things. Today's hearing is only to remove the property from there. So they're removing it from the IL or from the general development plan because it that. Uh, is associated with industrial light. So um, that's the action that's being considered today. And um, the again, the, uh, the once removed, it, it's a statutorily required process that, that, that the property has to go through. So, and it will be noticed again, I'm sure. Uh, I believe that's, that's correct, is noticing will read. Yes, correct. And the citizen can access the staff, Ms. Tusing, or Ms. Leiter can be accessed before that hearing if you have questions or need anything explained. Right, because uh, this is all I have right here, these three little sheets of paper. Right. They can go over the history of the property with you. Planning staff members are not supposed to dialogue with the public because they're not under oath, but the staff is accessible to you. Yeah. So the, uh, the staff can provide you, they can point you in a direction where you can provide or access much more information than just the mail out. The mail out is simply a noticing. And uh, another point of clarification, well, let me clarify with the clerk, anything put on the overhead has to be given to you for public record, but if it's something that's already part of the public record, such as a yeah, noticing, is... <laughs> so. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, I'm just against that apartment complex in my backyard and that's that's what it looks like it, we're going with this right and again that that's will be another application we have to kind of compartmentalize our discussion even though that 
uh, it's been stated that's what it is uh, until an application comes before the commission we have to uh, presume that it's open so. if I just make this comment so this this is kind of the way of the world things change and then what you have to do in my opinion I've seen my neighbors do this and this is what I I'm kind of surprised how successful they were but they got a group together and they responded to something going on in our neighborhood and that that really is what the public does and I'm gonna tell you it changes things but but that's really what moves the process, in my humble opinion, watching what's been done. You can do that. You have to be motivated. You have to energize people and all that. You just, it's not as simple as just saying, I don't like it. So, But my recommendation is I've seen this board. I've seen the commission. I've seen major groups make significant changes when it's impacted by the public. Right. And, and uh, certainly in the next two weeks or before July 11th, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do some of that. May not. It's very helpful. I'm telling you, th th this board, I can tell you, and I know the commission listens to their public constituents. They do. And I've seen it change in my particular neighborhood when they came in front of me, and I was, I was terrified. So just know that you have power. Don't think you're powerless. Right. Well, that, that's the reason I'm here. Uh, yes, sir. And, and uh, my colleague's here for the yes, same sir. reason. Very good. So th thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. So the uh, the other speaker card I have is a uh, uh, Ronald Miller, uh, Mr. Miller. It's, I'm sure uh, you were here also for the other ones, but uh, you still have an opportunity to make a statement regarding this application. I'm Ronald Miller, and I have been sworn. Uh, I'm probably about two weeks ahead of where I should be, what I was proposing <laughs> okay. to do, since I found out what's going on exactly. Uh, but like Mr. Smith, I'm opposed to this project. And uh, I do like Paul. I do appreciate, Paul, what your comments you made about what neighborhoods can do. Uh, we're in a gated community. It's a new development. Started out as Cal Atlantic. It's a huge development over there. Single family homes, villas. Uh, unfortunately, they sold it to Lenar, but Lenar is finishing it out and they've done a good job on it. So uh, we'll be back. Uh, but uh, when you're I know you're, you, when you take this out, if you make this, if you, you're going to, you want to take it out of the present zoning and you're going to make it residential. Is that correct? That's the request. Uh, That's the request. Well, right at this time. The questions to the plan commission yeah. right now because you haven't gotten it before Right. You uh, and again, to, to be clear, um, the, the opportunity is to make a comment, so there can't be a, okay. a lot of dialogue. We'll okay, just, I understand. Uh, okay. Initially, look, listen for concerns and then try to address direct staff or ask staff to, okay. to address those. But um, again, this application is only to remove it from the general development plan. All of those things will be discussed and, and um, uh, addressed at another hearing. Okay. So, okay. so it's just kind of in limbo. It'll be limbo once you take this out of the As, 280 acres. <laughs> uh, we understand there is an application pending. I don't know that it's uh, in right. limbo. That information will be available. Staff can uh, direct you to the details of those applications. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, those were the speaker cards I had. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one else come forward, uh, we're going to close the public comment portion of the hearing, and we're going to go to staff closing comments. Any clo <laughs> um, No comments from staff. Uh, applicant closing comments, or rebuttal, actually. <clears throat> right, try not to drop this again. <laughs> um, I just want to um, point out this site, this 30-acre site, um, and I do want to say it was highlighted wrong on the gentleman's map. Um, he highlighted the portion that is right now an industrial park with very large buildings and industrial square footage. The part, the 30 acres we are moving south of that is separated from that, the overall general development plan by a large wetland system. Market conditions change, and this portion of the property, because it is isolated, is not developing as it was planned to many moons ago. Um, this is a master plan community, as you pointed out, uh, Mr. Chairman. Things change. 
it's um, the ranch contains well over, I would say, 20,000 acres um, of planned development over the past 30 years. Things change, the market changes, what people want, that changes. Um, so this site right now was entitled, well, because we just had the comp plan um, approved, it is now entitled to the mixed use community residential. So it now has residential underlying entitlements. There, the zoning on it is plan development mixed use, which allows for residential. We are not changing the zoning. All we are doing is taking this 30 acres out and in the future, in July, asking to put it into our Lakewood Center DRI, which has entitlements that will go on this land. This land will sit without any number of um, density or intensity entitlements for a few weeks until we come back before you in July. Um, and just to point out, this was a plan for industrial. Industrial is more intense than a residential use. Um, the reference to apartment complexes, that is not appropriate at this time uh, because this land has no entitlements once it is taken out of this overall general development plan. And that is all that I have. So just one point of clarification in your statement. So if this were to stay as it is today, it would be developed as industrial or could be, could be no. developed? No. because the comp plan has changed. The comp plan has changed. Before the comp plan amendment, this site was planned industrial. So they would have had another industrial park like what is south of Gatewood Drive hmm. on this little 30-acre parcel. So, so there, that is... to me, that is more of an intensive use than but, uh, residential. But what I'm trying to understand is if we don't, if if this pro, if this application fails, the option would be to, to change it, to, uh, rezone it to industrial? Or we would rezone within the, we'd have to rezone part of the general development uh, I'm plan. just trying to understand the, the, uh, the options. The, 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 only the options. only entitlements in this site are commercial, office, and industrial. Right. The retail office yeah. may, or commercial may be allowed in the mixed use future land use category, but industrial is not. Right. So the, again, I'm, I think the trying to understand that this process began some time ago. It, it's not that we're trying to catch up with uh, the comprehensive plan. Uh, Correct. Okay. All right. So it, this isn't an action that this is the first step, this is actually... This is the second step, and then in July will be the third step. Okay, all right. Um, is, does that conclude your rebuttal? All right, so we need to limit comments to the statements made during rebuttal, so... <laughs> Can you do that, Paul? No, sorry. <laughs> all right. Just, just for comment, there, there is a list of, of um, proposed uses in this, or scheduled uses right. that was limited by striking it out. Uh, yes. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it is in public record. Right. What, what could have gone on there? Right. That's not an apartment complex. Yeah. I, I think, uh, is it your testimony that the proposed use is less intensive than what could have been done otherwise? That's what I'm trying to get to. That's what I'm trying to understand. So, yes. all right, it, thank you. An, an industrial park or homes. Okay. That, that, those are the two differences. Very good, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we're gonna close the uh, the public hearing and we'll open it up for discussion or deliberation. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rutledge. So, I don't think there's any doubt by all standards, ULI, that industrial is a much more intense and less accommodating to other residential. And so, to a certain extent, my argument would be intellectually that that's a better decision than what was going to be there. Um, I live right out in this area, so I, I know it pretty well. I also think that uh, a statement of a residential use of a different configuration uh, has a lot of things that can make it more compatible, because that's all we can decide. Is it compatible? And so I think that the, the interesting thing to me is not whether it would be residential, because I think the design around there should be residential, not industrial you know, a bunch of mini warehouses with trucks and laborers and in and out all different times is not attractive to me. Like, 
I don't live far from here. I wouldn't want that on this particular road because I use that road. So I think the other part of this is the interesting thing is that what's coming. And I think that residential in Lakewood Ranch is not a problem. The, the density is an issue. Access is an issue. Design is an issue. Um, pricing is an issue. I mean, there's all those other things when I say industrial versus residential. I'm preferring residential. Now you can get in the detail that we hope to hear about. And, you know, Lakewood Ranch has been a pretty good uh, community member, and I have a lot of confidence in them. I also think that residents can have a lot of input in this. So I think that's where the next crux of this is. So I'm not opposed to this transition. I'd much rather have less industrial here than what was planned, and so I'm going to vote in favor of it, and I'll be in anticipating the excitement of the next submission. <laughs> no way. So, anyway. All right, any additional uh, discussion, deliberation? Okay, seeing none, the chair's going to call them uh, uh, before we vote on it. Let's get a motion. <laughs> uh, right, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion. Based upon staff report, evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing, and finding the request to be consistent with the Manti County Comprehensive Plan and the Manti County Land Development Code as contained herein, I move to recommend approval of the Manti County Zoning Ordinance Number PDMU 0680GR3 and amend and amend and the amended general development plan with stipulations one dash one through fourteen as recommended by staff. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Um, is there smock second? Uh, any additional discussion? All right. Chair's going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes six zero. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to. The next item, which is number eight. Number eight. No. No, eight no. was continued, right? Seven and eight were continued. You have to open them. Okay. Six I'm and sorry. seven, you need to vote on it. Seven, I thought we uh, Separately or together? Separately. You have to introduce the item, open the public hearing, then move to continue. About six and seven. Okay. No, we have to continue them yeah. in the minutes. Yeah, I know that, but. Um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, Ms. Tucson, can you please read item number six into the record? Yes, item number six is Ordinance 1911, Lakewood Center, DRI. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. Rosina is the planner, but it is being, there was a notice uh, problem, so it's being continued to the July 11th, 2019 uh, meeting at 9 a.m. or as soon thereafter as may be heard, and it does need to be re-advertised. Okay, very good. Um, Ms. Shank, I have to open it for public comment, correct? correct? Okay. Correct. All right. Uh, so is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this item? Anyone at all? Left. Yeah. All right. Seeing no one come forward, we're going we're gonna to close the public comment portion, and chair will entertain a motion for continuance, correct? Is that, is that appropriate? Yes. So. Mr. Chair, I recommend, I, I make a motion that we continue to July 11th, the Ordinance 1911th Lakewood, Lakewood Center. Is that a, that's how we do it? Motion to continue? <laughs> yeah, yeah, motion to continue. Second. <laughs> okay, got a, Are you sure? Yeah. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Thank you. Uh, I best I could. Chair, chair uh, we'll call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0. Uh, item number seven, Ms. Tuzin, can you please read item number seven into the record? Yes, item number seven is the companion case to item number six, which is PDMU 0630GR5, Lakewood Center General Development Plan. Uh, this, again, needs to be continued to July 11th, 2019 at 9 a.m. or as soon thereafter as may be heard, and it shall be re-advertised. Thank you. Uh, again, I'd like to open this item for public comment. Anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on item number seven, please do so. All right, seeing no one come forward, we're gonna close the public comment portion of the hearing. And again, Chair will entertain a motion to continue. I guess I'll do it again, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I make a motion to um, continue to July 11th, the Planning Commission meeting at 9 a.m. PD, PDMU 0630GR5, Lakewood Ranch, Lakewood Ranch Center General Development. Very good. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Smock, second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Chair will call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose, like sign. Chair vo votes aye. Motion passes 6 0.
Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not very good at charades. Uh, <laughs> the clerk is indicating that we need a uh, we need to take a recess. So we're gonna Sounds take like. uh, <laughs> we're gonna take a is uh, five minutes okay or ten? Let's go ahead and take a ten minute recess. Uh, it's uh, ten forty five ish right now, so we'll be back at uh, ten fifty five. So um, chairs, I mean, uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a recess.
go ahead and resume the uh, public hearing, call the meeting back to order. So if you could, please um, find your seat, silence cell phones, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get going here. So I think we're up to item number eight. Is that correct, Ms. Tusing? That is correct. Item number eight is PDR 1903ZG, Lakewood Ranch, Parcel D. This is a quasi-judicial hearing, and Jamie Schendelwolf is the planner for the county. This is a rezoning of approximately 230 acres from the General Agriculture Special Treatment Watershed Protection Evers Reservoir to Planned Development Residential Special Treatment Watershed Protection Evers Reservoir Zoning District. It is located on the west side of E-Line, U-Line? E-Line, okay. E-Line? I meant to call you earlier. E-Line Road and 500 feet north of the intersection of E-Line Road and State Road 70 East. It's also approving a general development plan for a 475 uh, unit single family detached and single family attached uh, residential lots. As I said, Jamie Schindelwolf is here for um, this county and Miss Ellis is here for uh, the applicant. Very good. And uh, I think some folks may have come in who were not previously here. Is there anybody who expects to testify on this application? If you would please rise to be sworn in. Anyone at all? Okay. I thought there was one. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate? Thank you. Since you're late, you're going to have to stay after the meeting. <laughs> the strongman contest. Yeah. All right. Yeah, were you at the strongman competition? Is that what it was? <laughs> All right, very good. All right, uh, again, for the record and for, for the commissioners, have there been any ex parte communications on this application? No, no sir. All right, seeing none disclosed, we're going to move forward. Uh, did we already read this into the record? We did, didn't we? Okay. A applicant presentation. If you would, please come forward, state your name, and that you have been sworn. Danielle Ellis, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Again, I am a planner with the law firm of Grimes Goebel. Um, today, I have with me Everyone from our team, we have um, representatives from the developer, Pulte Homes. We have our um, engineer, our environmental scientist, and our traffic engineer, and also um, Caleb Grimes from our office. Who? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that name before. <laughs> and, I'm, and I am going to um, move uh, relatively quickly through this one. Um, You've seen quite a few uh, projects in this area come through. It is the northeast quadrant of Lakewood Ranch. Um, this project in particular, as Ms. Tusing said, is located um, approximately 500 feet north of the intersection at State Road 70 and E-Line Road. There is no connection. Um, the site does not abut State Road 70. There is a parcel that will be um, just south of this overall project that is planned for future commercial. There has there was a few things in um, the advertising that was different, so I just wanted to clarify that. The um, current zoning on the site is agriculture, and we are proposing a rezone to plan development residential. The general development plan is for 475 single-family attached and detached units. The surrounding zoning to the east is the Lakewood National Development, which is um, zoned plan development residential. They have a golf course and a mix of residential unit types. To the north, we have the county-owned lands that are zoned A, and to the west is the Premier Sports Campus, which is also county-owned zoned A. And as I mentioned before, to the south, there is a vacant parcel zoned A, um, but is in a master plan to eventually develop as a commercial project. The future land use in this area is mixed use community with three sub areas. There is the residential sub area, the activity center one, and the activity center three. And this was um, adopted in 2009 at the request of the developer. There have been um, a few amendments to the overall comp plan sub-element and the specific northeast quadrant um, comp plan that was approved in 2009, and I'll just go over those briefly. In um, 2017, the county did a 
um, amendment to the sub element for the mixed use community within the comprehensive plan to allow the activity centers in all areas of the county to be optional. And then just recently, last week, the board adopted a amendment to the Northeast Quadrant comp plan to reduce multifamily units, increase single family, decrease office, and decrease commercial entitlements. As you can see, this area is slowly transitioning from agricultural to more of a residential and non-residential development. There have been, I believe, four residential projects approved in the vicinity over the past year. There are two overlays on the site. It, this site is within the um, watershed protection for the Evers and the special treatment district. Uh, the site plan has been designed to meet all additional protections of those overlay districts with increased open space, wetland buffers, um, reduced impervious area, reduction in stormwater outfall rate, and an increase in water quality treatment. The open space provided with this site is 37%, which is 84, approximately 84 acres, and the required is 35%, which is 80 acres. There are no permanent impacts to the wetlands or um, the wetland area buffers, and the total acreage on the wetlands and wetland buffers is around 60 acres. Uh, the green belt buffer on the west side abutting uh, the substantial wetland system will be included in the first 50 feet of the wetland buffer area. So the 15 foot green belt buffer will be included within, or the 15 foot green belt buffer will be included within the first 50 feet of that wetland buffer just to utilize what's existing and go in and clean up some of the vegetation. The gross density of the project is <coughs> 2.06 dwelling units per acre, which is consistent with the approved surrounding projects and under the future land use category, the maximum is three per acre. The site does have two pedestrian access points onto E-Line on the north and su southern end. And then we also have two pedestrian access points that are optional on the southern boundary of the project, which will eventually depending on what type of commercial development occurs, will be constructed. Um, if it's something that is beneficial to both the commercial and the residential, those access points will be constructed. If it's something like mini storage or that type of use, then those may not be constructed because that just wouldn't be safe for anyone. Um, for access points into the site, we do have one full access at the northern end of the site and more towards the middle southern end, we do have a right in, right out, left in only. The roadways are planned to be private and gated at the option of the developer. Um, we do have one specific approval request with this project and that is to reduce the front yard setback by two feet for yards with front loaded garages. Um, the intent of this requirement within the code was to provide a 25 foot separation between the structure and the sidewalk. We have requested to reduce our setback to 23 feet. Then there will be an additional two feet of grass before you get to the sidewalk. So there still is that overall 25 foot separation between the garage and the edge of the sidewalk. And just to recap, the request that is before you today is for a rezone to plan development residential with a general development plan for 475 single family attached and detached units with an ex a specific approval for the 23 foot setback on front loaded garages. Um, my team and I am here, we're here to answer any questions that you may have, and I greatly appreciate your recommendation of approval on this project. Very good, thank you. Any uh, questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead to staff presentation. Good morning. Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Jamie Schindewolf. I'm a planner with Manatee County, and I have been sworn. Uh, mostly, I'm going to go over things that Danielle has already presented. She did a good job of giving a comprehensive overview of their plan. Um, just for context, this is where the project is located within the county, um, east of I-75, out in the Lakewood Ranch northeast quadrant. Their request is to rezone approximately 230, 31 acres to plan development residential. They've presented us with a general development plan, and they are in some special treatment overlays on the watershed protection overlay. What this means, in addition to what she's mentioned with their site design, is that the project will be subject to a 25% reduction in allowable pre-development runoff for the Braden River watershed and a 150% water quality treatment is required for the proposed development. Oops. Future land use for the site is this mixed use um, community designation. And this was something at the request of the landowner years ago. The comprehensive plan envisions major centers of suburban and urban activity within this future land use category. The property is included in some sub areas as well, which are mixed use community residential and mixed use community activity center one and three. The range of potential uses for this area includes suburban or urban density residential developments with a gross residential density of a maximum of three dwelling units per acre. Here you can see the zoning, those hashes are those, um, those special treatment and the watershed overlays I mentioned earlier. But you can see the zoning is currently A, general agriculture, but this is an area that has been transitioning away from that agricultural zoning into planned development, either residential as proposed today, or planned development mixed use at some of the major intersections like Lorraine Road and State Road 70. Their proposed plan has a density of a gross density of 2.06 dwelling units per acre, putting them beneath that three dwelling unit per acre threshold. They are proposing slightly more open space than is required, 37% as opposed to 35. They've included a 2.5 acre amenity center as part of the project as a neighborhood focal point, and they are providing multiple accesses, both pedestrian and vehicular. This is just a chart um, that shows with the Northeast Quadrant, as mentioned, they have certain entitlements to residential and commercial development. This is just showing that with this new development, they do have sig enough single family detached and attached al allowance left to proceed with this parcel D development. They've requested a specific approval to LDC section 402.7D.7 and staff believes that the purpose of this LDC regulation is satisfied to an equivalent degree because of that two-foot right-of-way section that will provide 25 feet from the structure to the sidewalk. This request is consistent with the nearby development pattern of agriculturally zoned land transitioning to planned development, which is a positive aspect of the development. The one negative aspect that's somewhat major is that surveys have indicated habitat suitable for gopher tortoises and eastern indigo snakes may be present on the site and there are bald eagle nests nearby. But it is stipulated that an updated threatened and endangered species survey must be required, must be completed, excuse me, before final site plan will be approved. Overall, staff recommends approval of this general development plan and rezoning. Thank you. Any uh, questions for staff? Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna go ahead and open the uh, hearing up for uh, public comments. I don't have any speaker cards, but is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're gonna close the public comment portion of the hearing uh, and uh, Questions, question for the Planning Commission. Any information? We haven't had any questions to date, or to date. Uh, <laughs> till now. Is anybody, uh, <laughs> does anybody have any thing they need clarification? Statement. Yes, sir. 230.77 acres. 
And how many units are proposed? <laughs> 475. Uh, what's the ratio, quickly? Uh, what was the density? Uh, 2.0. <coughs> two, two to the acre, roughly. Thank you. So, all right, very good. Uh, I have really nothing. Uh, I doesn't have one appear question. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that because of the two kind of environmental uh, water conditions, that we're comfortable that we're not making any considerations that imp impinge on those. What, which which are those specific? These ones? are the um, because you're in these two flood zones, right? And we have. Uh, I think the wetlands that run through there to tie this into the other two uh, wetlands on the north side and the south side, it's a pretty significant access point to get from this piece of property to those other two pieces. I just want to make sure that we, you feel comfortable we've not impinged on that in any way, materially impinged on that. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Rutledge, with respect to this project in the general area, this is in the uh, middle portion of the Brighton River watershed and has been alluded to by the applicant and also by um, the case manager, Jamie Shinwolf. Uh, this project does lie within a uh, special overlay uh, district associated with the Braden River watershed and does require uh, additional uh, drainage requirements, both with respect to flow reduction and water quality treatment requirement. Uh, with respect to the um, hydrology of this particular area, we are talking about um, particular forks of Braden River, which extend northward and then eastward um, beyond State Road 70 in the upper reaches of the Braden River watershed. And this particular project <clears throat> for the uh, potential for the uh, development aspects of this project is staying outside of the. Um, I'll stay. Excuse me. Is staying outside of those environmental mentally sensitive areas uh, with respect to both the uh, floodplain component of this project um, and the uh, runoff component of this project. This project is required to uh, address uh, flooding, flood mitigation, and also the uh, discharge and attenuation requirements um, incorporate the Braden River watershed, which is available for this particular area. Because it's interesting, if you look at the Lakewood National Golf Club there, <clears throat> this obviously was all this kind of floodplain there. They cut that up, but they cut off the connection between that and the north side of that flood. So this is the last way for this to kind of flow back through there mm -hmm. because of what has happened kind of at the Nationals kind of cut that piece off. So just want to make sure that that access is going to be maintained. <clears throat> Commissioner Rutledge, with respect to the adjacent uh, developments and um, I'll clarify one other point. Uh, E-Line Road and then further to the East Bourneside Road, there are um, particular crossings on the, on the forks of the Braden River. Um, within this particular area, they are substantial crossings. There are multiple barrel box culvert crossings, things of that sort, um, that were um, designed and calculated uh, based on my clarification, which would be the Braden River Watershed Management Plan. Uh, for this particular area. So the crossings themselves have been incorporated. The design has been incorporated through the watershed management plan, through the available drainage modeling, and so, as such, the developments in this area are also incorporated. The uh, design is incorporated into the uh, watershed management plan as well. And with respect to that study, we are speaking of a drainage model, which is hundreds if not thousands of nodes and links that are uh, comprised of this particular watershed study. So it is very substantial, it is very in-depth, and it is a prime example of what we're looking for, for as far as the remainder of the county when we're speaking about Bullies Creek, Pierce Drain, things of that sort as far as the level of detail. So you feel good about this? Comfortable, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not allowed to use anything with <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gersenberger, is it, uh, is it correct that these stormwater ponds that we see on this uh, proposed site plan, that they would be utilized for floodplain compensation, that uh, these would be incorporated into the system? So any, any floodplain that would be displaced by development is actually being uh, 
for lack of a better description, uh, offset by the, the stormwater facilities that are shown on the plan? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, that is correct. The uh, layout of this particular general development plan um, does include, uh, does identify floodplain mitigation areas in, the, in addition to the stormwater facilities that would provide water quality treatment and attenuation. Um, other projects in this particular area, the Lakewood National Project, Del Webb Project, uh, even further to the west, the shopping center that's underway now for the uh, corner at Loring Road and State Road 70, they have all incorporated the Braden River Watershed Management Plan into their design analysis. So the, the, the model is evolving and growing into be an accurate representation that's what's being constructed and and that's why you feel comfortable. That is correct, Chair. <laughs> not good. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> yeah. I if not, I have a doctor for you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions for staff? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to go ahead and um, go to the. Uh, uh, I ask one other question. Uh, just one. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So the commercial piece that you said doesn't touch seventy with your property, uh, Miss Ellis, is is that owned by the same ownership and just not being presented? It's it's a separate piece. Is this for staff or for the applicant? Well, I was going to ask the applicant. Well, she knows the ownership. Yeah, uh, we can go to rebuttal staff, and. They, sorry, they... do you know if this property is owned? <laughs> sorry. Uh, so just uh, generally. The question is, who owns the adjacent property? Is it being carved out of the previous zoning? Uh, I, <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> uh, yeah. Take care of it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. you want to put that? Thank you. All right. Um, so, again, any additional questions for staff? Not for staff. Not for staff. Very good. All right. We're going to go ahead and uh, go to the applicant's rebuttal and uh, hear what. The land in, the, in this area is owned by um, SMR Northeast. Whenever this uh, parcel is closed on, it will be owned by Pulte Homes. And that southern parcel that is intended for commercial through the comp plan and our LDA will still be in the ownership of SMR Northeast. Understood. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> and that is all I have. Thank okay. you. I'm glad he asked the question. I'd hate for you not to have anything to rebut. <laughs> And how All much right. easier can I be? Right? Very good. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and close the public testimony portion of the hearing and um, open it up for discussion, deliberation, or the chair will consider a, a motion. So what is the pleasure of the commission? Anyone? And do you feel good about this? Yeah, what do you, yeah, what do you feel good? Mr. Chair, I feel good about making a motion. Very good. Um, <clears throat> based upon the staff report and evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing, and finding the request to be consistent with the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan and the Manatee County Land Development Code as contained, as conditioned herein, I move to recommend adoption of Manatee County Zoning Ordinance PDR 1903ZG as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Roth, second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, the chair will call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item we have on the agenda is item number nine. Um, Ms. Tusing, can you please read item number nine into the record? I will, sir. Thank you. Item number nine is PDMU 1905 ZG Springs at Ellington. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. Jamie Schindelwolf is the planner. This is a rezone of approximately 6.88 acres on the eastern, eastern portion of a 37.17 acre site. Currently, 30 acres of the site are already zoned PDMU. The rezone is from suburban agriculture to the planned development mixed use zoning district. It's also approving a general development plan for a 292 unit multifamily residential development and 150,000 square feet of non-residential development. There's a schedule of uses that are that was voluntarily proffered by the applicant. The project is located on the southwest corner of 60th Avenue East and 29th Street East in Ellington. Uh, Jamie Schindelwolf is here for the county and um, folks from ZNS are here for the applicant. Very good. Thank you. All right. Uh, again, um, this is a uh, quasi-judicial. So um, have the commissioners have any, have any of the commissioners had any ex parte communications? No, sir. Anything? 
None. Okay, seeing none disclosed, we're gonna move forward. Thank you very much, and uh, if you would, Mr. Grimes, uh, come forward and present your application. Thank you. And and I'm, I work with them a lot, but I'm not with ZNS, so. <laughs> but just pulled one on Margaret there a little bit. Uh, good morning, I am Caleb Grimes with Grimes Goble, and uh, I have been sworn. Thank you. I. I, I really am I'm, I'm pleased to be up here representing Continental Properties, who is the applicant in this particular uh, uh, application. Uh, we have with us Mr. Aaron Knopp that uh, you will hear from a little bit later that will talk about his company and about his plan for the residential portion of this uh, site. You know, long ago we established these mixed-use areas. We originally established them all pretty much along the, the interstate at the uh, quadrants of the, the various quadrants of the interstate. And this is one that's been in, in place for a long time. And our idea with these mixed use quadrants was that we were going to have something that is uh, uh, going back to the way we have uh, areas that have commercial, that have office, that have residential, that have all of these things incorporated within them so that we do ultimately cut down on some of the driving and some of the uses and have things where people that can live and can walk and go to different places. And this quadrant of I-75 and US-301 has long been one of those areas. I mean, we put this mixed use designation on it back in 1989 when we adopted the original comprehensive plan. And so now it's pretty, pretty cool that Continental is uh, proposing to supply the much needed residential in this area with a uh, really uh, beautiful market rate apartment complex that you'll hear more about later. Uh, and I get to introduce our team a little bit. Uh, we do have uh, ZNS that is representing Continental. Uh, with ZNS, we have Jeb Mulock, uh, engineer, who is here. Rachel Layton, the planner, who is going to actually go over the project in more detail with you in just a moment. But as we all know, in this area of the county, <coughs> transportation and traffic has been a challenge over the years. And so we have Michael uh, Yates with the White House Group, who we're going to have uh, go ahead and, and uh, address traffic and transportation and go over all of the things that are planned and are funded and are being done in this area to, to address traffic and then discuss what uh, this project, the impacts it will have on this because I think that tends to be one of the con major concerns that we hear in this area all the time. Uh, as you knew, you probably know we passed a half cent sales tax uh, and uh, one of the uses for that half cent sales tax is for projects on, on uh, 60th Avenue that this project will uh, impact. And you'll hear about that from Michael Yates. But at this time, uh, I'm gonna let uh, Rachel Layton come up, planner with ZNS, to tell you about the project. Rachel. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Again, my name is Rachel Layton. I'm a certified planner. I'm with ZNS Engineering, and I have been sworn. Um, we are very excited to have an opportunity to present this project this morning. Um, because as you guys know, out, out by the outlet mall, there's a, a few pieces that are left for development, and this is uh, one of the larger of the pieces that remain. So this property is located at the southwest corner of 60th Street East and 29th Avenue East, and is approximately 37 acres inside size. We have the outlet mall and Ellington Ice immediately to the west of us. I don't know if I can get the mouse to cooperate. I cannot. Ooh. Um, okay. So we have Bougainvillea Place to the east of the property and Oakley Subdivision to the north. The proposed movie theater and hotel are to the south of the property. The property was most recently a tree farm, and prior to that it was a grove, so it it's, has been used agriculturally as portions of it is, are zoned agricultural. There's one small wetland along the drainage canal, which is government hammock tributary. Both the canal and the wetland will be protected. The canal separates the property from the mall and the lot to the south. Uh, the property has 
two future land use designations on this property. So we have mixed use in the southwest corner of the property. That's about 10.91 acres. And then the rest of the property has a future land use of Res 6, which is 26.6 acres. For the residential development that we'll show you as I progress through the slides, that project is 23.75 acres of the 37 acres. So um, we have all these rules in the conference plan of how we do the math to get the consistency. Um, so I'm gonna try and go through those quickly, um, but I know it's very complicated and uh, um, I'm gonna call it planning math. But we have with the 10.91 acres and the 12.84 acres of res six and mixed use, under that 23.75, we actually have a maximum of 404 dwelling units possible per the comprehensive plan but we're proposing the 292. So we're below what could be approved um, in that area. For the Res 6 portion of it, the Eastern commercial portion of it that I'll show you in, in a minute, the com comprehensive plan limits the non-residential development to 150,000 square feet. So our commercial development is 13.42 acres of the overall project. So we have an area, as Caleb mentioned, that is transitioning and a large portion of it has been developed under the mixed use. We're seeing now, now development on the east, uh, west side of the interstate, as well as uh, the outlet mall and the shopping centers that are right off of 301 and heading up uh, 60th Avenue. But we have 6.88 acres that are currently zoned suburban agricultural, and that's not really appropriate at that intersection anymore. Right now this intersection is two collector roads on your thoroughfare maps. The remaining 30.29 acres are zoned plan development mixed use. The property is partially located in the entranceway overlay district. So along the western boundary of the project and then the southern boundary. So not the entire project, but portions of the project. So we've applied the entranceway overlay district regulations to the entire site just to um, be conservative. The proposed zoning request will amend the map to plan development mixed use and the, uh, as the agricultural designation is no longer appropriate due to the development trends in the area over the last 20 years. The request is consistent with the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan. Surrounding projects, again, Bogan Via Place is a density over four dwelling units per acre. Oakley Subdivision has over two dwelling units per acre. Tuscany Lakes, which is not on this map, but is further to the north on uh, Mendoza Road and 60th, is seven dwelling units per acre. And then to the west and to the south, we have the mix of commercial uses, including the outlet mall and ice rink and the recently approved movie theater and hotel. Again, it's one of the few remaining vacant pieces of property in this area of the county. So now I have uh, a general development plan. Uh, it's hard when we have a, a I'm gonna call it a bubble plan as Margaret calls it sometimes, um, <laughs> uh, to really kind of show you what the limits of the development area really are. So we tried as best we could in color to show the areas in green are the, the future right-of-way setbacks and the landscape buffers that are required um, along the roadways there and then the internal buffering that we'll propose between the commercial and the residential and then the buffering that would be required along the drainage canal. Um, we're also putting our stormwater ponds in that general area so that the maintenance can be um, addressed that way. So the areas in yellow are really where we can put our parking and our building. So we're kind of narrowing down where we're, as how we're going to develop it as this project progresses. But again, it's 292 multifamily units and will, will ultimately consist the residential project of two 11, 11 two-story buildings, a mini center with pool, stormwater landscaping and parking. Um, commercial development will be between these two parcels on the eastern side of the project with 150,000 square foot maximum. Because we don't have an end user for the commercial side at this point, we have offered a list of uses for the plan development mixed use. We've worked very hard with staff to make sure that those are compatible with residential um, developments to the north and to the east, as well as what we're proposing for the multifamily component of the project. So some examples of uses that are included are restaurants, re retail, sales, schools, veterinary clinics and veterinary hospitals, daycares, offices, banks, and drive through establishments. Some examples of excluded uses are gas pumps, service stations, equipment sales, flea markets, funeral homes, and vehicle repairs. We try to take out some of the higher traffic generating and some of the more um, incompatible uses. Uh, we do have a 12-foot future right-of-way setback along 29th Street, an 18-foot right-of-way setback along 60th Avenue. Each of those roads will have a 20-foot landscape buffer. We propose a, an 84-foot right-of-way 
off of 60th Avenue East coming into the project so that we have a main boulevard into the commercial, the mixed use project. We ha will have also a 50 foot right of way for a north south connector from 29th back to that 84 foot right of way. We'll construct a left and right turn lane at the entrance at 60th Avenue. The project, the residential portion of the project will be fenced and gated with the main entrance from the new north-south 50-foot right-of-way. We're proposing emergency access onto 29th Street East uh, at the north end of the residential project. The building setbacks for the residential project will be 25 feet from 29th Street East. Commercial parcels will have 30-foot front yard building setbacks, and because we're added in these rights-of-way, rights they'll also have 30-foot uh, setbacks internal, except for the parcel to the south. Residential open space will be 30% minimum or 7.12 acres. Amenities may include, again, fitness center, pool, and pet playground. Commercial open space will be a minimum of 25% or 3.36 acres. This project design anticipates a minimum of five acres of stormwater ponds. Um, again, we're protecting the government hammock tributary. We'll have a 30-foot waterfront setback. The wet, there is, that wetland that's there is about 0.15 acres, and we'll have a 30-foot buffer around it. There are no existing native habitat areas on site due to the previous use as a tree farm. Sidewalks will be provided throughout the project and we're proposing a potential pedestrian connection to the outlet mall. Uh, we're working through that now, but uh, we felt like to really be mixed use in this area, it would be good for us to at least put that on the plan and really try and pursue it. The project does have one specific approval request to reduce parking from two spaces per unit to one per 10 un units uh, to 1.76 spaces per unit. We did provide a parking study of other continental properties. They have uh, a number of projects here in Florida. Two of them are here local to Manatee County, uh, both of them that with less than what we're requesting. Um, the project is consistent with comprehensive plan and the, the neighbor and the land of Atmaco. We did have a neighborhood meeting on May 9th, and we've been soliciting um, letters of support. So I'll pass those out, and I want to bring the traffic engineer up next, Michael Yates. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Michael Yates with White House Group. I want to walk through the traffic uh, real briefly with you, and I have a couple of things I'm going to put on the overhead. Um, what I wanted to walk through is since this is going through the GDP, we have done a TIS as part of that GDP. We are not seeking the CLOS at this point in time, so a more detailed analysis will come along once we get to the next step. But I wanted to walk through the preliminary analysis and what is being done on 60th Avenue and how our plan integrates with those improvements that are being done. Um, the first table here is showing what is allowed under the existing zoning with the M M PDMU and the existing A1. So that would allow for 924 p.m. peak hour trips. What we are proposing with the 292 multifamily, and we had run it with the 200,000 square feet of commercial, would come in at 752. So it's actually a reduction in the number of trips that could be developed under the existing conditions. Um, we did a preliminary level of service analysis for 60th Avenue, which would be within our study area. Uh, all the links operate acceptable level of service with the proposed development. Uh, with the exception of one segment, which is the segment from 26th Avenue to our project driveway. And let me walk through that with you. There we go. I think this is for the most part. Um, this is the improvements that are being done on 60th Avenue. This is their alternative to. They are still going through the design process, but this is their current preliminary plan. It is a funded improvement, and basically it widens 60th all the way up to 26th Avenue. 
Uh, that will be a traffic circle at the factory shops, which is currently a signalized intersection. So the traffic circle will then continue as a four lane section to the north to 26th Avenue. And then let me show you our GDP so we can talk about how that integrates into the project. Um, so you can see, let me see if I can get this. So basically this is the traffic circle at factory shops. This is 26th Avenue. So this is the four lane section that is there today. This is our proposed project driveway uh, just north of 26th Avenue. We are proposing a northbound left turn lane basically that goes from the end of the existing turn lane to our project driveway and a southbound right turn lane. Once we know, once the final design of what that commercial is, we would be able to evaluate it further. The apartments, there's sufficient capacity to accommodate them and a good portion of the, res the retail. It's just until we know what that exact layout is, how that will function, what those exact uses are, it's kind of hard on a preliminary evaluation to get any further. But there is sufficient capacity outside of that short segment between the project driveway and 26th Avenue. Very good. Uh, I'm certain this will be a um, significant topic of discussion. So could you please uh, again explain the turn lanes that are being proposed? I want to see, uh, <coughs> I want to see pointing at the exhibit the, where those would be. Absolutely. Yeah. So here is 26th Avenue. Mm -hmm. We are proposing a northbound left turn lane that starts here and continues up to our project driveway. Mm -hmm. And then we are also proposing a southbound right turn lane um, that will go into our project driveway. Uh, these will be designed to meet Manatee County standards. We've already met with traffic operations to go through this we just wanted to make sure that we had a plan in place as to what they would feel comfortable with for those turn lanes with regard to the 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 right away adjacent to um the pro project boundary is is right away being reserved or set aside for future expansions Yes, we are showing the future right-of-way setback of 18 feet on 60th Avenue. And if uh, we will continue to coordinate with staff as the design progresses, if there's a need for additional beyond that to make sure that we've got all of the proper widths that they need for that, that okay. section. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. And just to be clear, we're, we've gone from testimony to, <laughs> to questions of the applicant. So um, uh, with regard to the, the proposed right-of-way section, do you, what are you considering or contemplating that the future right-of-way of 60th Avenue would be? Has there been a, a discussion as to what that uh, roadway section might be? I believe the comprehensive plan requires 84 feet in that area. I Oh, I see we lost. Well, oh, here comes Clark. Well, we'll we'll allow that to come up during so staff. we are pushing as much of our uh, turn lanes onto the side of our project the side of the road that abuts our project okay and then uh, again additional questions from the information that was previously presented um, uh, the uh, there was a proffer of uh, uses uh, you proffered uh, yes. schedule yes, of uses did. so is it your uh, is it your understanding that this is a limited list that um, it would be binding and that these would be the only uh, uses allowed under this application if it yes uh, we understand that that becomes part of the zoning ordinance for the project so if it's not listed it's not an allowable use you'd have to go through the rezone process correct okay. yes all right just wanted to make sure that that was clear and then the uh, the other a uh, question that I had from your uh, testimony was you mentioned uh, a second or a, an emergency access. Yes, from the residential side. From the residential side. So uh, to be clear yep. is how many, how many points of access for the residential areas are being contemplated? They will have a main gated entrance hmm. internal to the project. Right. And then they'll be able to utilize 29th Street East 
or 60th to get back to the thoroughfare roads, mm -hmm. and then they'll have the emergency access directly to the north of them from the project. Is the emergency access a uh, like resident only access, or is it only going to be usable for only for emergency emer service vehicles? Right. And then in the event of an emergency, it, the gates would be left open. Okay, very good. Any uh, any additional questions or? Yeah, I, just, I had a couple for the applicant. Um, so, it, describe to me the conditions of the roundabout as you've kind of designed them here, because the the, the problem has always been there, the uh, geometry of that intersection. And then why does the, the road design bulge out, kind of narrow down and then expand? Uh, and the last thing is why not use the 24th Street access as opposed to putting all that entrance traffic there? So, there's three questions, I guess. To, to dovetail on to... Paul's question. Can you clarify who's doing the roundabout? Yes. So uh, these plans are Manatee County designed plans. Um, we, we did ZNS Engineering and uh, White House Group did not design the improvements for 60th Ave, and they are still proposed and in design and review by the county. But I understand they're to be funded by the half cent sales tax and are in the capital improvements program um, for the next few years. But I think some of those questions might be better directed to staff. Unless Michael thinks he can answer them. All right, so then let's go to the things that you have involvement in. So why is all the residential coming off onto the most dynamic roadway as opposed to what seems to be the most logical access to the north? Uh, as opposed to 60th Avenue or as opposed to 29th? Why go on to the most busy thoroughfare with residents and their kind of driving techniques as opposed to using that as the thoroughfare? Because that's where you can get the most geometry for that intersection. Are, are you speaking? No, no, I'm not. He's talking about that. Sorry. The residents that have the acreage that goes to the west side of your project, why would you access that onto 60th when you could go off into the north where there's, there's a dead end there, where there's simple access and egress, and it takes you off to a planned intersection as opposed to adding another? I'm I'm having a hard time understanying where you're proposing you know where the, north the access is on your to be. Can you look yeah. on the north side of your project? It's the same graphic you have. Yeah. yeah. Go to the north side of your project. Go to the center of your project for the residential and tell me why you don't access there. That's my question. To, to the uh, right of the intersection at 20... 24th, 24, 26, 29. So, you're, so to make sure I understand, you're asking why are they coming out on the access on 60th as opposed to the access on 29th? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, it on 60th Avenue, you have a larger right of way. You have a lot better geometry. They all end up on 60th Avenue anyway. Agree. And so the geometry that you can provide for the amount of development works a lot better on 60th Avenue. Uh, okay, that's that's your engineering opinion. Right? Yes. So there's no uh, no reason to have. A lesser traffic area for more traditional slow traffic coming out of a different spot. You, you think it's better just push them onto that highway? I, that's I, your engineering recommendation. That's what you're saying. I, I think 60th Avenue is the proper location for that access. So you take all your residents through the commercial piece into there, back them up, slowing down, doing through. You think that's the best solution? It is the best option for the residential access. If you put everything on 29th, you're going to run into some geometric issues in getting enough that distance means. for that 60th Avenue. What is geometric issues? So you got to provide turn lanes to allow all that traffic to enter and exit the site. Mm -hmm. If you're talking 700 cars, that's a significant amount of traffic trying to make sure you have sufficient turn lanes. We have that ability on 60th to provide that geometry. Don't you own all this land out south of there? We own the land south of it, but you still have to make the intersection work that's existing. We don't control the intersection. So when you push lanes to a different direction, you still have to be able to get the turn lane in. You cannot have offsets from the road on the east side. And you so you still have to make that intersection work. OK. I, I think I understand Mr. Rutledge's question. Let me ask it a different way. Maybe we can get to a point of clarification. With the graphic that's being shown there, will the residential, uh, the the residents of uh, the residential units be able to go to 
the north and get on 26th. Correct. Yeah. They can go north. 29th. I'm sorry, 29th. So th they would have the opportunity to do that. Correct. And As a second means of access, yes. If by chance the the uh, commercial areas that are adjacent to 60th were busy and caused the backup, they would have an alternative route. Correct. Okay. As as so, would the commercial as well. Okay. So that. So so geometrics don't really matter. You already have have a plan to go up that way. There's a plan to go up there, but to split the traffic so that it's a secondary access, not their primary access. It, is that reason because of the, we talked to, you talked about geometry, the, the, the right of way at 60 is a larger right of way and could accommodate more Correct. travel lanes and turn lanes. So that would be the primary Correct. Uh, it, access. And, yes. And we can control how that intersection will function so at our driveway. Let me just driveway. ask this question, not to interrupt you, but if you own all that land, and most of the traffic, what percentage of the traffic is going to go back down to 301 and out? What percentage coming out of your residential unit? Uh, we estimated somewhere in the 75% range would go south. 75, that's, so that's my argument. So if you had a turn lane, you could make your turn lane as big as you want, get on to 70 at that intersection, and, and the geometrics wouldn't matter, would they? But we don't control the other corners I understand, of but you're, the I'm intersection saying 75 at 60 of your product will go down that way. 75% you can control. Correct, and, and that's how they're going today through the 60th Avenue. If you bring them up to 29th, the issue you're going to have is particularly the intersection there at 60th and 29th because then that is then going to be substandard to accommodate all the geometrics that you would need I'm, to allow traffic to come in 29th. I understand. You're, you're, you're a scientist of some sort, and I'm just a little <laughs> guy who drives there, okay? But I'm just saying to you, you can you can tell me geometrics, you can tell me easement. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a lot easier for a resident to get out on 29th, take a right, and take another right, and not get in the traffic flow that's there. I, you can say whatever you want. I'm just saying. If I'm a driver, and I've been driving a little while, I just don't agree with you. Point but, of information. Is there a traffic light at 29th and 60th? No. no. Will there be? No. We don't know. It's an unsignalized... But you're not going to have a signal approach. where they're getting out anyway, right? Right. What's that? So you're not going to have a signal where you've designed it currently to get on 60. That's Correct. That's so it's no different. It's ridiculous. I, I, listen, I, you're 100% you're, you're right. I'm just a, a local ham bone here, but I just don't, I don't agree with you, no. and I'm just telling you so. I understand, and, and it's not the right out that's the issue. I it's, know that. That's what I'm saying. 75% of it's traffic. not a problem. That creates the issue. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be argumentative. I just don't understand the size. To, to uh, take the comment you just made, you're saying the inbound traffic, the what what would be the the concern or the uh, the impact of the inbound traffic that you're referring to? So the outbound traffic with like the direction we were going in the discussion that 75% of the traffic will head south. Mm -hmm. So the outbound traffic particularly in the PM, is lighter movement. And they're making a right out. So whether they come out 29th or off a of 60th, that's still going to happen. Mm -hmm. That You're increasing that segment that you're adding the traffic to a large amount to from basically where the driveway is up to 29th. But it's the inbound traffic that we have problems trying to accommodate on 29th, having all the inbound traffic on 29th. Meaning it, you would contemplate that they would stack up into Yeah, because you would 60th? probably need left and right turn lanes at the intersection of 60th and 29th. And then you would probably need to provide left turn lanes on 29th. And getting all that geometry in, we only control the southwest corner of that intersection. Mm -hmm. So adding all that geometry to that intersection to get that to function correctly is problematic from us because we only control that little southwest corner. Whereas where we're showing it on 60th, we control the whole west side and we can provide the geometry we need. And when we talk about geometry, really what we're talking about is the width of right away that you control. Is that, uh, is that with correct? The, with the, for the large majority of it. Yeah. Part of it is offset of roadways, like you start adding turn lanes, what happens is, like if you add a northbound left turn lane, on the other side of the intersection, you need to widen the road mm -hmm. so that you can accommodate, you're going from three lanes to two lanes. Mm -hmm. So you need to widen on the other side of the turn lane. 
And so what happens is that creates the problem when you go north of 29th because then you get into the residential area and you're trying to widen with homes right adjacent to the roadway. And the geometry is, we've seen it in some locations where you have to then go far left to get into the lane that, Correct. you know, at, at one point they probably lined up from each other, something Correct. like that. Okay. All right. Understood. 29th isn't exactly the widest street. Yeah. The county there. Yeah. You know what? I, listen, I, I bow to your expertise, but I'm just telling you, I've driven up there, been involved with this this corner for a long time. I think this is great that it should get done, but I just think you're making a horrible mistake when you say the best thing is to take 700 cars and push them out on 70 in between a unique roundabout and a commercial node that you're making, which is going to be 200,000 square feet, and then put 700 cars in there. I think if you tell me that's a better solution, where did you... I, I just I find it shocking that you can say that the geometrics are better. I just don't believe you. I'm just I'm just saying. I bet you if we hired an engineer and said, "Look, we want to have a turn lane out of the north, and that's our primary entrance, and they want to make 75 percent of them access down there," I bet you we could figure it out. And now you may not have been tasked with doing that, but I'm going to tell you, I don't believe it. Um, with regard humbly and respectfully, <laughs> with regard to the uh, roundabout, yes, is this project. Uh, is the concurrency going to be contingent on those improvements? Uh, it is a funded CIP project, so, so it would be considered in place from a concurrency standpoint. Okay, all right. All right, and then I uh, had one additional question with regard to stormwater, so... Um, and then <coughs> I also have Aaron Kanap, who is going to give a little presentation on... All right, we're past the project uh, presentation and to... Uh, comments. We already ran our 15 minutes, but I have a question regarding the stormwater. Mr. Yates. Um, Mr. Mielock, I looking at the uh, the general development plan that was provided, there's a 25-year um, stormwater line that or floodplain line that's shown. Um, was the project uh, <coughs> did the project consider the 100-year line? and only shows the 25 year or uh, was the 25 year the limits of the preliminary analysis for stormwater? No, no, both. Uh, and this, I'm Jeb Mulock from ZNS Engineering and I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, no, both. We, we looked at both uh, and will, with the final design, look at both 25 and 100 year. Okay. Yes. So, so it, it was considered, even though it's the, the discussion or the presentations limited 25, the 100 year was... Uh, uh, contemplated and the the facilities that are being um, represented. Correct. Okay. Yes, right. absolutely. Just want to make sure that that was a point of clarification. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like even with the 25 year, there was in some areas maybe some significant impact on the uh, on the property. So, and the uh, stormwater facilities that are shown in the general development plan are those uh, shared facilities, both floodplain and for. Um, yes. Okay. Yes, they would be. Okay. All right. Can I, can I add just one thing to the discussion that was just going on? Because I, I think sitting back there in the crowd, I was I was absorbing a lot more than uh, than uh, sitting at, standing up here and getting pelted <laughs> with questions. So I, I think one of the things that uh, uh, Michael was trying to uh, uh, get through was that. If, if you look at the plan where they have the main entrance coming in now, where, where we're proposing it, there's a number of turn lanes that operate not only uh, uh, internally, uh, I'm trying to, so uh, in, in terms of additional turn lanes, not only exiting the property, but coming in. So if you were to take this whole geometry here, and try to move it to that north intersection of 29th and, and 60th, the right-of-way is not available on the north side of 29th. And there's obviously, there's resident residential homes already backing up to that right-of-way, and I don't know whether there was ever a reservation done, but there would have to, essentially, to be able to provide the geometry that we're proposing at the, to move that entrance up to the intersection, would, would virtually be impossible at this time unless you did some right-of-way takings. I, I think that's a, a key point. You. Yeah. I hear you. I, I think I understand what you mean. But I may humbly disagree because 
I can tell you that if you say you're going to put 700 cars through that intersection in between that stop sign, which is what it is currently, and where this confused integration is of the roundabout, and you think 750 cars coming out there is a best solution, I just argue that you're smarter than that. I think you can do better. Well, That's and, my and humble opinion. Yeah, and I don't think, I don't think the argument is, is that all the traffic is going to be routed directly to that. I think as Michael was saying, if if the intersection is at a peak time for commercial and residential, yeah. people are going to make the choice to go to 29th. And, and that's, you know, providing two points of access is better than, than one. So yeah. I, think we've, yeah. I think we've provided the best plan that's possible with the right-of-way that's available. I, I would argue this. You've given the best plan that you've thought of. I would argue that if your directive was to do something else, you'd think of something more creative. I just don't think you, that you weren't tasked with that. You don't do that. This is the easy way. I get it. But I still don't agree that putting the majority of that access in between that stop sign and a confused roundabout at best and the traffic that now is three lanes coming through there and and. I was involved in giving right away so that you get the three lanes up to that traffic light that's there currently, that if you think putting 700 cars out at that middle road with no particular design, if there's no traffic light there, you haven't solved the problem. You've, you've yeah, exacerbated it, and it's not going to be better. And, and now's the time to address that, in my humble opinion. You're entitled to be the expert. I'm entitled to say I think it's a curious res resolution, and that's what I would say. You can tell me about geometry because I didn't go to geometry class, but I'm going to tell you, I drive around that place a lot. I know this area very well. I've been involved with a number of the properties up there. I think this is a great project. I do not think that's a good solution. I don't think you've done your best work, and I, I have a lot of respect for you guys. You're well respected. Caleb only has the best projects. I get all that, but I'm just saying to you, I disagree with you. Okay. Well, I, I think, yeah, I, I think we... Can agree to disagree. I think the question is not a creativity or an engineering question. It's more of is economic? there right away available? Uh, if it's economic, right away, yes. if, economic. Yeah. If we can't, if we don't have the right away, we can't do it. No. Okay. Period. Yeah. Again, we disagree. Yeah. Mr. Ralph, you had a question? Yes. Well, it's more of an agreement with Mr. Rutledge. We're forcing traffic onto 60th, which is a pretty bad thoroughfare now. I don't know what I looked at your traffic study, which I guess you did, and I don't know whether we have a public traffic study. But if you think that by putting these numbers of cars, whether you do it on 29th or you do it on 60th, you're going to do anything to alleviate traffic? No. What you're going to do is the future is going to be that the county is going to have to come up and provide roads to make this happen. Mm -hmm. This is a future disaster coming. All right. Very good. Uh, again, any questions for the for the applicant? Agenda. All right. Very good. We're going to move on to the uh, staff presentation. We haven't done that yet, have we? It seems so long ago. <laughs> Hello again. My name is Jamie Schindelwolf, staff planner with Manatee County, and I have been sworn. Thank you. The project before you today is the Springs at Ellington. This is approximately where it's located in the county. I think we've established this um, near I-75, adjacent to the outlet mall and the ice skating rink. They're requesting a rezone of 6.88 acres to plan development mixed use, which will bring the entire 37.17 acre site into plan development mixed use zoning. They've presented a general development plan as discussed with 292 multifamily units and a maximum of 150,000 square feet non-residential. I believe there was a change made, I think that's part of the update memo, um, to bring it down to 150,000 square feet instead of 200,000 square feet because of the commercial locational criteria, because they are not on an, on an arterial, they are limited to 150,000 square feet in that area. As mentioned, the property is partially in an entranceway, and they are complying to the entranceway requirements for the entire site. The future land use is a mixture of mixed use and res six. As discussed, there's a calculation that determines the number, like the 
number of dwelling units allowed because there are two future land use designations on the site. They would be allowed 404 and are proposing less than that at 292. They are in the coastal planning area. Comprehensive plan policy 4.4.2.2 required them to provide a hurricane evacuation plan for the project in coordination with the county's emergency management division and they have done so. Res 6 is a designation used for areas of primarily medium density urban residential development and support uses where mixed use is meant for major centers of suburban or urban activity in areas with a high level of public facility availability intended to develop with a horizontal or vertical mix of residential and non-residential uses. Here we have a horizontal mix of residential and non-residential proposed. As discussed, they will be meet, they meet commercial locational criteria um, because they're at an intersection of two collectors, so they are allowed up to 150,000 square feet of neighborhood commercial. The zoning for the site is currently a mixture of PDMU and A1, but the rezone request is to bring it all into PDMU. The site plan, as you've seen, includes residential on this portion of the property and commercial on this portion. Uh, they are proposing 30% open space on the residential half, which is a 5% increase from typical because of the entranceway. They're proposing 25% on the commercial half, again, 5% increase because of the entranceway requirements from what we would typically require. They've provided a schedule of uses as mentioned they are proposing a maximum of two stories for the residential component, whereas they would be allowed up to three technically with our codes. And the commercial, they are proposing a maximum of four stories, which is consistent with our code. They have one specific approval request for a parking reduction. Staff finds that this is, uh, this satisfies our land development code to a sufficient degree based on the parking study provided demonstrating other properties including two within the county not necessarily within our jurisdiction but provides appropriate local context showing that they have successful properties with a similar parking ratio I did go ahead and look at some of the reviews for those properties and none of them had complaints about parking so I think that's a pretty good indication that parking is not an issue and we always like to see a reduction in impervious space, things like that. So we do support this parking reduction. The positive aspects of this project are that it is consistent with the nearby development pattern. Agriculturally zoned land has been transitioning to planned development in various ways. And because of the mix of uses, it does provide a transition between the higher intensity land uses, the outlet mall, the interstate, et cetera, the multifamily on that side, and the commercial on the other, a transition between that and the single family residential uses that currently exist. Of course, we've discussed negative aspects quite a bit and I'm sure we will do so more shortly is that the higher trip generation might um, adversely impact 60th Avenue East, but there are planned improvements and the project does intend to provide interconnections between the residential and commercial areas, including their efforts to provide a pedestrian connection down to the outlet mall. So hopefully people who live in the apartment and work in those places will be able to use alternative ways to get back and forth instead of adding to the load on the road. Staff recommends approval with stipulations and is happy to take questions. Very good, thank you. Any questions for staff? Mr. Roth. Is there any proposal for anything to happen to these roads countywide? DOT wide. Um, the the roadways adjacent, so that'd be 20, 29th Street and 60th Avenue. 20. 29th Street East. Oh, for the record, Clark Davis, interim deputy director of uh, traffic management. I have been sworn. 29th Street East is the road that's adjacent on the north side. Um, as was indicated during the applicant's presentation, it's a de designated collector roadway. It's a two, planned for two lanes and 84 feet of right-of-way. Um, it doesn't cross I-75. 
and it's essentially providing access to this property and commercial property to the west. And so it's, it arguably provides some collecting function. I'm not sure um, if we'll ever make major improvements to it like we might some, some of our other collectors, but I could see us putting in sidewalks and perhaps bike lanes at some point. It's a two-lane road. It is a two-lane road. And it's not going to be improved. Not planned for it remains a collector roadway. It'll become a better two lane road someday, but we don't someday. plan to widen okay. it. We don't have anything programmed for it at the moment, meaning we don't have funding in our five year program. 60th Avenue East uh, is also a collector roadway, but a, a major collector approaching arterial roadway in terms of, of function. It's 60th Avenue combined with Buffalo will provide a continuous connection from 301 to Moxonwalla Road at some point. We've got some pieces we're still working on. Uh, 60th Avenue was the subject of three different projects in our infrastructure surtax plan. Um, the plan was to cover a 15 year period, but these are three of the earlier projects in that overall plan. And those three projects have been combined uh, or at least they're proposed to be combined in the capital improvement program that the county commission will see this fall. Included in that are the improvements that uh, the applicant had up on the uh, document camera to show the additional lanes and the roundabout from factory outlet shops to the south. It's also so supposed to cover from there northward to Mendoza Road and perhaps across Mendoza Road if the right pieces fall into place. Uh, they have clearly had some uh, communication with our traffic design staff about intersection configuration and about the capital projects. There may be other opportunities to talk to them about what we can do on that section between Factory Shops Boulevard and 29th. Um, if you look at that, it, it's built uh, more or less as the southbound lanes of a future four-lane road. There may be a chance to, to widen that farther north uh, and closer to 29th. At 29th, it does get awkward, though. The 29th Avenue, or, sorry, 29th Street right away is very narrow, and the 60th Avenue right away is narrower north of 29th than it is south. So the constraints that the applicant was referencing during their testimony are, are primarily associated with that north leg of the intersection, and it complicates uh, making a lot of improvements there without doing additional acquisition. Uh, so the... We do have improvements. They are programmed. The, there's, we've done some prior year uh, appropriations for it. The majority of the funding is in the upcoming uh, fiscal 2020 year with a little bit more in 2021. All total, I think we're around $14 million uh, programmed to address the improvements roughly from primarily 301 to 29th, but also some of the, the road north of there. The, State has improvements to the 301 at I-75 interchange that were, they have um, gone out to a new consultant to update the design for that interchange. The limits of the interchange improvements do extend as far back as the 60th Avenue roadway connection, so there may be some more intersection improvements there, but we haven't seen an updated plan to tell us exactly what those would be. It, we wouldn't expect them to make it any worse than it already is, but there may be some opportunities never to increase capacity there when they do it. Um, that project, the majority of the funding for it is in the state's fiscal 2021. That's their fiscal year that starts on July 1 of next year. And if they stay on target, that means they could start construction late in that year or sometime during 2021. Let me be a little more specific. From 29th down to 301, in the next three years, are we going to have four lanes, two lanes, six lanes, or will it be the same? It will be predominantly four lanes, but and what it is would it be now? transitioning to two lanes somewhere north of Factory Shops Boulevard. Having a developer like this working on the adjacent property presents an opportunity for us to work with them, and that may help us adjust those limits to, to expand the project somewhat. Um, but without having more of the detail in front of us, we're just looking at a rezoning and general development plan today. It's hard to say exactly what we'll be looking at on so the could the road county, road. after they see the plan, let's say this goes to the commissioners, and they see the plan, and they decide, like I think, that this road is not going to handle the amount of traffic, I'm talking about 60th, what can they do? What can the county do? Can they require the builder to do something, or do we have to come up with it eventually as a tax? 
if for now they've not requested what we call a certificate of level of service compliance. They have thought some about what their traffic impacts are, where the, the uh, level of service deficiencies are, and what some of their site related improvements will be. And so what you're seeing are those turn lanes that they've shown on this general development plan. Um, what I would argue is whether or not those are the final configurations of those lanes given that we've got the adjacent CIP project, no, but if they've it. coordinated that with our, our program management staff, then that may be the way it is. Regardless, at some point, either preliminary site plan or final site plan, they'll be required to submit what we call a traffic impact analysis that will have detailed review of their access points and their off-site impacts. And to the extent they create additional capacity problems, they will have to either implement improvements or pay a proportionate fair share of them. So they will make a contribution of some sort uh, to address the uh, concurrency or the level of service deficiencies created by their project and uh, independent of that still make the improvements at their uh, site intersections which would be the intersection at, of their driveway at 29th, their driveway at 60th and probably the intersection of 29th and 60th because it's in such close proximity to those driveway connections. Uh, just to kind of expound on that, uh, that line of discussion. So with this application, the, uh, the applicant submitted a traffic impact statement. So that's essentially a disclosure of the presumed generation of traffic for this project, correct? A traffic impact statement is a more generalized analysis. They did a trip generation comparison of the trips that they were uh, capable of generating under their existing zoning versus the proposed zoning. Mm -hmm. They think that the trip generating potential is lower now, but mm -hmm. there's nothing out there today. So right. anything they do is going to be more than what we've already got. And so it's the, t the concurrency part doesn't care about the difference between the zoning anymore. It cares about the difference between what you've actually built already, which is effectively nothing for right. this, versus what they're going to come in with on their, their preliminary and, plan. And, and then the next steps are going to be, uh, there's really no approval of the traffic at this level. It's just an acknowledgement of what the, what they're presenting at, f at future um, times uh, with the final site plan. When they seek concurrency, that's when they'll actually have to submit something and the county will review it and make a determination of the appropriateness of what's being represented and then have potentially an ask from those impacts. Is that... Uh, generally accurate? Yes, it would be no later than final site plan. They would be required to conduct that more detailed analysis and identify mitigation. So the fact that there may be something that uh, may be needed in the future that's unknown, it, it doesn't give them the opportunity not to do something. Uh, like, for instance, if by chance the, the analysis they provide in the future shows more of an impact and requires longer turn lanes or an additional turn lane, something like that, this process doesn't uh, negate the requirement for them to do those improvements. Is that the rezone process I'm talking about? The rezoning and general development plan do not set the final site-related improvements or the concurrency-related improvements. Right. So, okay. I just want to make sure we understand how this evolves. This isn't the the end of the process. This is uh, actually just a statement of impact. So. Point of reference. Yes, yes, sir. So what you're really saying is, although I have no problem with it filling the land development code, I can't vote against it because the roads are not going to work. Is that correct? Well, I, I think um, if it's my understanding, um, I think everybody acknowledges, and that's why they're required to do an impact traffic statement, is that any improvement is going to generate traffic. The obligation then falls on the applicant to potentially uh, pay their fair share or, or to, to do no damage. I, I, that's probably not any cars on the no, road are going to add. Right. But they're going to have to build a bigger pipe to, to get everything through. But it's the applicant's responsibility to do that during the construction plan, final site plan, construction plan. Is that is that true, Mr. Davis? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, what I'm saying is, if I were on the, at this stage of our, our uh, approval, mm -hmm. the only approval we can give for a project has to do with the land development code. Well, so I, it fits the land development code for getting the impact future of the roadway, 
if it fits the land development code, I have to vote for it. Well, I, I think what we're our our commission here is to evaluate it with regard to the land development code. And the land development code requires that they do these improvements if they have these impacts. So I don't think one is mutually exclusive from the other. What we're saying is um, there's going to be an impact. That's your obligation to fix that impact. But uh, if, you, if you do it consistent with the land development code, it's my understanding that um, those, uh, the details of that would be at a different process. It's not actually this process. I think in the zoning, um, Many times in Manatee County, we know what's going in the site, but that's not the case for every zoning hearing. Sometimes you have no idea what's going there, but I think the obligation is that the the land development code uh, understands that and requires that you you make your way. What you're really telling me is that the county commissioners will have to make that decision. Itself. Well, uh, the, there there are going to be biases. Everybody has experience, but what I'm saying is, I, I think the the we're not doing a traffic analysis right now. We're doing, you know, what was presented with this was a traffic impact statement. So the information is not be been presented it. to make a proper decision. Okay. We're trying to work through the details. I think again, everybody acknowledges you build one house, you're going to add cars to the road. You build apartments, it's going to add cars to the road. Now we have to figure out and understand that the land development code understands that and and uh, that uh, staff good. will will ensure that um, it's properly addressed. So let me climb off the soapbox now. And <laughs> is that what it so a, Mr. Rutledge. Yeah, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that, you know, this is designed as, quote, mixed use. And as mixed use, typically that means multiple integrations and multiple access points. That's been my experience. And so we have <clears throat> the outlet centers right next to you. Uh, we have the development to the south that's got integration for retail. And we have these, what I think are really separate developments. You've got apartments and they have a road. I think they're trying to get the road onto 60 so they can have their sign there, but that's just a guess. But they, they've got two shopping centers and they've got this apartments and they're not really integrated. They're just on a similar road and they're on a similar piece of property. I don't think that is being really mixed use. That's multi-use, which is I'm okay with. But the desire of that corner was to integrate it with the, the shopping center, which I know you said you're going to try and do. Um, but I don't think that meets my opinion as a mixed use. You just have parcelized the land, that's fine. But, but I don't think it then imputes on that all those intrinsic benefits that might be a part of that. So I think I look at each one of these separate and said, hey, they're going to put all these guys on this roadway. And I, it says here, however, the only uh, segment of 60th Avenue from 26th Street East to the Project Driveway would be projected to operate below the service level. And the other segment at 100% and 40% of the retail is going to not perform. So you guys have already told me what I thought I said, which is it's probably not the best solution, but that's what you're doing. So I'm, I'm just looking at what you've given me, and I'm, I just don't see it as meeting the test of uh, what you would ask us to do to give you that. And that's, that's my sensitivity, and you're right. They can solve it later, but I think if we ask you those questions now and you have a good answer, great. You can disagree, like you said. All right. All um, right. One, one additional question for uh, Mr. Gerstenberger. Um, sorry, my computer's not uh, cooperating right now. But um, the um, when the applicant uh, provided testimony, the applicant's engineer, uh, he indicated that the uh, stormwater facilities would be fa uh, shared facilities, dual facilities. Uh, the stipulation that I now see in the revised uh, report. Uh, staff report says that that's not allowed. Is that correct? Again, I can't. Mr. Chair, the uh, <clears throat> revised language for stormwater stipulation number two provides the option for either sole use floodplain compensation areas or for the applicant to perform drainage modeling um, of government hammock drain to um, demonstrate no adverse impacts are created. Uh, in conjunction with the development of this particular project area. Um, I would not know it also, and you had brought up the question previously with the applicant, the, this particular project presently is outside of the 100-year floodplain based upon the flood insurance rate maps. However, mm -hmm. the county has a 25-year floodplain study that dates back to 1998, which identified 25-year floodplain delineation in this particular area. So the applicant would be responsible for providing additional modeling of this particular area to not only 
go through and um, do, do floodplain mitigation for the 25-year floodplain that is identified today, but also to identify and to provide mitigation for 100-year floodplain coverage based upon their drainage modeling. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, any additional questions for staff? All right. Hearing none, we're going to uh, close um, the uh, testimony portion of the hearing and we're going to open it up to public comment. So I have four speaker cards and I'm going to call your name and if you would please come forward, uh, state your name and that you have been sworn. So the first card I have is Kathleen Va uh, Varnador. If you could please come forward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Varnador and I have been sworn. Um, I'm an adjoining landowner on 29th and 60th. We have about 18 acres there. Um, I moved out to the property when I was in, in the 70s. And uh, at that point, it was a two-lane dirt road. Um, we're talking 40 years later, and it's a two-lane paved road. <laughs> so um, when the county came in to ram that road down our throats, they said, oh, it's going to be a four-lane feeder road, and it's going to bring in the development from Mendoza, which pretty much everybody uses. So 60th is very busy right now, as you all well know. Um, it, um, you can't hardly get on 60th from 29th. We have tried to develop our property before in 2006, and the county commissioner denied us because of the traffic issues. So this has been an ongoing fight for my family. And um, I'm not sure why it is that it has taken so long for the county to do anything about 60th, because you have brought in the outlet mall, you've brought in commercial property, you've brought in residential developments. Can you give me any idea when this is going to be resolved? And with regard to that, I think probably the best question or the best answer is probably going to come from staff. So Mr. Davis could probably point you into uh, in the direction of uh, at least what's known to date. Yeah, I understand the developers will have to pay a portion of this. But at some point, the county's going to have to realize that they need to address this. We're talking about a, a, a main feeder road that comes in that goes right to I-75. With the outlet mall and everything else, we're t you can't even get on that road half the time. So, and during Christmas time, trying to get to the outlet mall, forget it. So now um, the county had told us that we had to get with the federal government and the state and the county and redevelop all this stuff before we could do anything. So the federal government obviously is coming in with I-75 to make major changes to this interchange. Um, seems the county's a little behind on this. And, you know, you can have developer after developer, but unless the county does something with 60th to make it the four-lane feeder road that has always been on the comprehensive plan, I don't see where this is going to go any further. You want this property to develop, but yet the traffic is a huge issue. And this, this project, I have no objections to the project. I, you know, this is good for development in the area, and this is where we want it to go. But unless the county does something with 60th, it's sort of a moot point. I can, I can get another development to try and go in, and they're going to deny me as well for the traffic issue. And there's my two cents on it. <laughs> or three minutes. Thank you. thank you. Okay, thank you. Very good. Uh, the next speaker card I have is Howard Fletcher. Mr. Fletcher, are you here? Yes, sir. If you, if you could please state your name and that you have been sworn. My name's Howard Fletcher. I've not been sworn. Okay. I have only one general comment. Oh, you have to be sworn though. You can't. You can't talk. The microphone doesn't work. So again, before we go, is there anybody else who hasn't been sworn? All right. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate? I do. All right. Thank you. My name is Howard Fletcher, and I live in uh, Oak Creek. And uh, my comment is mainly has to do with the traffic. I'm not opposed to, this, to the complex. Yeah. I'm not opposed to any of that. But I live further up on, at the end of 60th, and I have a terrible time getting out of the neighborhood. And uh, some, sometime the county's got to do something.
I rest. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the uh, next speaker card I have is Peter Kriegel. Yes, sir, if you could please state your name and that you have been sworn. Uh, I'll wit my name is Peter Kriegel. I live uh, in Bougainvillea. That's virtually across the street from this project. And you have been uh, sworn. Using the and you uh, have been data sworn. that Mike has already given us. You need to make a statement that you have been sworn. I I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing, so please. You need to make the statement that you have been sworn. Oh, I have been sworn. Thank you. My, my apologies. Not a problem. Uh, using Mike's data, 700 cars, if you put 700 cars bumper to bumper, that is 2.65 miles of cars. There is absolutely no way that this project can go forward and not have a huge traffic problem. Already, already when I come out of the uh, 26th Avenue and try to take a left, I cannot do it because the traffic is backed up further than 26th. It's already past that. There are times of the day that you do not go out because of the traffic. If you do, you go down to 29th and take a left and go all the way around to, to avoid the traffic that is there. This is, this is not a situation in which the traffic cannot, it cannot be divorced from the approval of this project. There is no problem with the, 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 uh, the uh, apartments. There is no problem, but the problem is the road leading to it and if there is a hurricane, there is no way you're going to get 700 cars, 2.65 miles of cars out through that, that area. It's impossible. Well, thank you for your time. Very good. Thank you. All right. The next speaker card I have is Kay McFarland. Um, if you could please come forward, state your name, and that you have been sworn. My name is Kay McFarland, and I have been sworn. Thank you. And um, it's been a long process here for us, all of us today. I would like to say there's no issue with the apartments. The issue is the traffic on 60th Avenue. I think all of us would concur with that. I would be very interested in what they think the roundabout is going to do, because I am from New Jersey. Half the people in Jersey do not know how to drive around in a roundabout. The other half don't know what a roundabout is. If you are going, they now have two lanes going into the outlet mall and one lane going up 60th. Are they going to make it so that two lanes are able to go up 60th and then the developer is going to pick up the third lane that is going to go into his project? Maybe that would be reasonable. But if they're going to take it that it's going to come off and one lane off the roundabout is going to go up 60th, that solves nothing. We've got that now. You're going to have to come up with the idea of a stoplight somewhere because nobody's going to be able to get out of Bougainvillea. Nobody's going to be able to get out of 29th if that's their option. And then, as I talked to Clark earlier today, they don't really think they're going to extend from 29th, I'm sorry, from 26th up to 29th. They think they're going to leave that as a one-lane highway, as a two-lane highway right now. So then you have everybody trying to merge into that. Well, that's going to be even more of a nightmare. I think we have to get the developer on board with the traffic people and the county. Now, I think they're pretty well in sync as far as coordinating time span for as far as the development of the apartments and the development when the county is going to come in and start to fix the roads. I think that's going to be in 2020, which is from the money from this one and a half or this half penny thing. But I think they really have to get together and decide what are they going to do, what's going to be the most effective for the traffic to work right. I don't see how they can take it out of 29th. I mean, I listened to what you had to say, but I don't think that is going to work. I think they really do have to come up with there in the middle, there between the Bougainvillea entrance and 26th, if they could get their turn signal in there or their turning lane in there, they'd have the wide enough area. They don't have it up there at 29th. Uh, but my thing is, is please, if the county could get together with the developer before it's approved, and I, too, agree with Peter, you can't divorce these two issues and pass this and say, okay, this is going forward. You have to take a step back here and say, we've got to go back to the drawing board. We've got to be sure the county's going to do this, 
and the developer is going to do this, and then come back again in a couple weeks or next month, and then we'll say, yes, we'll do it. But we waited this long. I think we should try to do it in a timely and a productive manner. The apartments are going to go through. That's a given. Let's just make sure the traffic is on board and the county has done their due diligence as getting these roads, this road situation straightened out. And that's my two cents. Thank you very much. Very good. And and just to be clear, uh, I think, uh, again, they have to be separated. It would uh, possibly, I think it would be a violation of the county rules and regulation, possibly state okay. state statute if we um, tried to marry the two, the traffic issue with the rezone. I th again, I think everybody has to acknowledge that any development generates traffic. It's just not the time right now to solve those issues. We have to do that through a separate process. So. Right, there may be a very strong recommendation that they <laughs> <try> Exactly. To <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, those were all the speaker cards I have, but if there's anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this, again, please come forward, state your name, and that you have been sworn. It, yes. <laughs> I think if anybody else does that, it work. <laughs> My name is Andy Branco once again, and I've lived in. Uh, and you have been sworn, right? <laughs> Oakley Place since 2005. I'm pre Bougainvillea and pre everything else that went on around there. Uh, if you would give me the opportunity to actually talk to you and tell you what's going on without getting cut off in three minutes, I will. I am in line with Paul Rutledge. Uh, Mr. Comley, I don't know where you are, but Paul has a feel for what's going on there. First off, 60th Avenue East going to uh, <clears throat> Mendoza Road was never four lanes. It was always two lanes. When Bougainvillea got built, they moved the roadway a little bit, juggled it around, and they made a swell in front of 26 so that the people who live in Bougainvillea could get out and get across. Okay? That was never a four-lane highway there. I argued in 2016 and 2017 to have right-hand turn-only arrows put in before Bougainvillea because... People coming in to go to Mendoza Road were using that little bit of strip where they could turn, and they were taking swan dives into the grass because all of a sudden they realized there was no road there. So that exists only because Bougainville. They can't get out of there. They can't get into there. 29th Street is a mess. The other thing that this is directly related to the other IMG property, which is where the theater is, and I was here for the commission hearings, and I pointed out one of the trouble points there was an exit from the complex onto 20, uh, 60th Avenue. I pointed that's not a good idea. So now we're going to have an exit entrance on 29th Street, which is still two lanes. And they, the proposal is they're going to put a lane over there so they can make a left-hand turn into the development. I'm not against the development either. Okay, we're trying to put 25 pounds of sand in a 10 pound bag is what we're doing. The other turn lane I also pointed out was 50 feet from the corner of 29th Street, which Mr. Rutledge took issue with. And he says, well, you're going to have these people coming out of there and they're going to try to get out of the development or the shopping area and they're going to get on uh, 60th Avenue to go north or south. Trust me, they're not going to be able to turn north. They might be able to go south, but they're not going to go north. Same thing with 29th Street. If anybody wants to make a left-hand turn coming out of the apartments or houses or whatever they call them, and they want to go north and it's rush hour, God bless them. Not a good idea. So this is the, this is the whole thing. You can't approve this the way it is now. The roads do not have it. And also, I did a lot of homework on Willow, Willow Bend. Willow Bend is pretty much done, but... Just can, can we just let just finish your thought? I I, I think uh, we understand that your concern is traffic. Well, you also have yeah. a lot of other developments. Uh, Silverstone East has another 240 homes going in there, and they're like 15 percent built. Right. That's traffic going towards there. Right. Okay. You've yep. got. Uh, we've only got three ways to get to 301. Right. Ellington Gillette Road, which is ridiculous. 
Ours is the main traffic road, and the other is Victory Avenue. They just they put the Oaks on Victory Avenue, which is part of... of uh, right, we understand the issue is traffic. Thank you very much. We have a major it, it, nightmare here. Yep. Okay, and the other thing I want to point out to you, too, I looked at the traffic circle, and I spoke with the engineer that's kind of working on it. Right, I'm, I don't mean to be rude, but your, your time I'm is up. I'm sorry for the guy. Yeah, really your, your time's up, and uh, yeah, there's know. a due process we have to follow, and if we violate it, um, it puts any objection um, at risk also. So. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, we have to follow due process, so okay. your time is up. So. All right, thank you. So again, is there anybody else in the audience who wishes to come forward? Anyone at all? Anyone? All right, seeing nobody come forward, we're going to close the public comment portion of the hearing, and then um, go to staff closing comments. Any, anything, no traffic, no, nothing about traffic, you're done. <laughs> For the record, uh, no, I mean, we've stated what the improvements are that we've looked at in the area that could, the applicant can talk more about what their, they think their impacts will be and what they, they think they'll encounter as mitigation as they go forward. But from a staff perspective, we've talked about the improvements that are programmed and will be available to serve at, at least um, base of it. It looks like they'll be consistent with the concurrency provisions that will be in, play, be in effect for subsequent steps of the development. Very good. Thank you. Commissioner Wolf, any, anything else? Okay. All right. Uh, that concludes staff closing comments. And we're going to open it up for... Uh, the applicant's rebuttal. Thank you. I uh, appreciate this. I, I think what you've seen is what I tried to tell you right at the beginning, is that what we have is a project that is appropriate for the area. It's in this mixed use. We're having the apartments. As all of you know, we can't build enough apartments. They, I literally fill up before they're built. And this is a good area for it. I will say this. I. I rarely would say I disagree with Paul Rutledge, but on, on this <laughs> now, one... Come on, on, be honest, you're under oath. <laughs> on, on, on one of these issues, I, I strongly disagree. We are doing a mixed-use project, and it's not vertical mixed-use, which means you have homes above uh, uh, residential, but it is a mixed-use and intended to be that way so that the people in the apartments will be able to use the neighborhood commercial. You heard that. It's called neighborhood commercial. That means it's going to have the uses that those people in the apartments can use. It's going to have the uses that the people that all live north of us can stop and use instead of having to drive down to 301 and try to find their way out there. That's the purpose of this. That's why we design things this way. Uh, it's not unlike, uh, to a great extent, town center, where you have the commercial going down the street, and then you have the apartments at the end of it at the, on the lake there. And, and that is one of the things that we designed for. Uh, and so it was really good to hear that I don't think we have any objections to what we're trying to do there. It fits. It makes sense. The question was, and I said it up front, was transportation and traffic. And what we've tried to show and explain uh, is how that will be accomplished. It's hard to do in that first little short minute when you, you know, time frame when you have it, but I want to say some things that, that Mr. Roth brought up that make sure that there is understanding on this. Our system, our code, does not allow us to get concurrency at this level. We're not even allowed to do that. So what Mr. Yates did is try to give you the general idea of what's going to happen with traffic out there that there's going to be some improvements needed on one stretch of road. There's going to be some turn lanes needed. We've already started looking at all that. But, but we can't get a concurrency approval, meaning that we're, our development will not uh, adversely affect the roads beyond the service level, that we're not going to cause those problems unless improvements are going to be made concurrent with our development. We will have to show that. I think uh, 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 Mr. Davis explained that, that we will have to go through that concurrency process when we get there, and this project cannot adversely affect that. Uh, and so we will go through that, and Mr. Yates was trying to give you suggestions. Now, when we do that concurrency analysis, we will look at 
funded improvements. So we're going to look at the road as improved as Ms. Varnador asked with the four lanes down from basically where we are down to the, to the roadway. We will also look at the funded improvement for I-75 and 301. And as Mr. Davis said, that actually goes out to 60th Avenue. And I don't know if you've seen it, but those improvements do things like right now when you get, uh, when you want to get on I-75 and go south, you have to go through and stop traffic and turn left and go around. They're going to have a ramp now from 301 straight on to I-75 going south. They're going to have the ramp coming off on the south side of 301 instead of this, this quagmire that you have. So they're going to make it where everybody doesn't have to pile up and then go at the same time on 60th. They're, they're, they're making some amazing changes out there. I've been involved with them with some of the other projects that you've seen. You remember we had Whiskey Joe's that came through, and that's where the ramp was going through. So we will look at it with that improvement that is funded, that is in the, in the plans, and we're going to look at it with the 60th. And then we're going to put our traffic on top of that. Now, uh, what Mr. Yates has explained to me, but I didn't, we didn't get into it, his 700 is after apartments and 150,000 square feet. It's not just the apartments. The apartments are a very small number of that. They really don't generate that much uh, traffic. Uh, I know with single family detached, you're about one per unit. With apartments, you're about half that. So in the peak hour, you're, you're maybe 150 to 200 trips, not, not the other, and that's over a whole hour. Uh, and so we will have to look at that. With the apartments coming first, we'll have to make sure that the traffic takes care, is taken care of, that there is concurrency. When we get to the uh, commercial, we'll have to do the same thing. And so we will have to meet the concurrency on all of that. I'll try to wrap up yeah, fairly, do. Again, fairly uh, quickly. There was a whole lot of stuff yeah, that was uh, brought up. Again, due process, trying to protect both sides. I, 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 I understand. Yeah. I will. I will. We had so much that was brought up. It was so, traffic. That was the only thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, so much with traffic. And, and finally, what I want to really stress on is that, and again, my disagreement with Mr. Rutledge, I work with developers and have for the last 30 years. And even though I'm not a traffic engineer, I work with the traffic engineers, I work with the designers, and where we try to, to do these kind of things is that you try to have your traffic not overburden something else. You put that traffic like it's designed in, in this instance where there is an ability to disperse your trips, to take care of them with the turn lanes, with the roads coming in and out. And this is a very good design, a very well thought out design, and it's one that works. And so what I would ask is that we're in compliance with the comp plan, we're in co compliance with the land development code, we, uh, and that with your understanding that we will have to meet concurrency as we go forward, and that we're not, if, Mr. Roth, if we were here asking you to approve this and let us waive concurrency, I think you'd have you'd be right to say, no, you can't do that. We're not asking that. We'll meet it. We ask you recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, we're going to go ahead and close the public testimony portion of the hearing and uh, open it up for deliberation. Um, again, I'd like to stress that uh, we have to be mindful of what we're here to do, and it's, it's not to approve a plan based on the traffic going to be generated. That process is, uh, occurs at a later date. What we're being asked to do is uh, determine the consistency with a comprehensive plan and the land development code, and we want to be mindful of that. Um, uh, I, we're here acting as uh, quasi-judicial judge-like folks and judging it on the merits with regard to the land development code and the comprehensive plans. I just want to reinforce that idea. So any, any additional thoughts? I think we've, uh, I think we understand traffic is an issue here. I have a thought. Yes, sir. So I understand the process mm -hmm. and I understand what you said, but there's no doubt in my mind that we have an intolerable process. 
The developers have to know in advance what's going to happen. That traffic study that they've done, or whatever the proposal, is frankly a joke because there is no traffic. What they have is what they see now. But they know in advance that there's going to have to be something done. Why isn't it possible for them to get involved with our traffic people in advance and come up with a number? No, we're going to have to wait until we get to the county commissioners. And God willing, yeah. they, will not, they will have a problem with the same situation. Well, I, I think, uh, Ms. Ms. Schenck, to, to uh, please uh, truth my answer. To do that, to ask them to do that would be a violation of state statute. Concurrency is not tied to zoning. Well, as, actually, it's a matter of our local code. We right. have a local zoning code that says when you file a general development plan, mm -hmm. you cannot get a sticker level of service because it's too general. You have, you don't have the level of detail to know. Ms. Davis can tell you what detail he needs. Mm -hmm. If the county wants to acquire all plan developments that have preliminary site plans and all of them do complete traffic studies, they can, but they have to amend the land of them a code to acquire that. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with the code the way it is now. And it, the election to do a general development plan or a preliminary site plan is at the applicant's election. Mm -hmm. So they've elected to follow the code as written to do a general development plan and at this point. With regard to the, the county's rules and the requirements for state uh, concurrency, uh, is there uh, timing with regard to when uh, that is required? Yeah, well, general development plans don't expire. So, I mean, it's when they come through for the approval assuming they're going to move in a timely manner, they're only responsible for mitigating their own impacts. They can't cor they're not required to correct deficiencies. Existing deficiencies is mostly what I've heard today from the citizens. Right. And they're not required to correct that in a state statute. Mm -hmm. And if people have a problem with that, they can lobby the legislature to amend the state statute and concurrency. It's basically what it is. Right. So, so you're saying that if the county commissioners don't pick this up as, a road as roads being inadequate to handle the traffic, the abutters or whoever else has to go to the state to get approval? No, I'm saying concurrency is a creature of state statute. Mm. And the developers are only required to mitigate their own traffic impacts or pay they either construct the improvement or pay their proportionate fair share of the cost. They can require a local development agreement, go through that to detail it in a written agreement on a phasing plan if it's a large project. But they're not going to solve everyone's problems with one project. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you're saying is that it's not the developer's requirement to take a D level service road and make it an A level service road. Correct. Just to make it. Uh, they're only they're trips. only required to cover their impact upon that road. Correct. So 60th is a D level road or F level road already. So it's not the developer's requirement to pay all these funds to meet the neighborhood's needs to bring this to an A-level service road. Correct, but we've had testimony from Mr. Davis on some county improvements. Yeah, well, I mean, there, to, there are county agreements and yeah. stuff like that can happen, so. What part can the county commissioners play in that? Well, keep in mind also, this is quasi-judicial, so there has to be testimony under oath from traffic experts to, to validate any basis for denying anything. Mm -hmm. and we don't the, have that right now, do we? <laughs> right, and... And with regard to the due process, the county commission is going to have the same responsibility that we have here. It is to take the information that's presented as testimony fact, and to they, evaluate it in accordance with. If they want more information from the applicant, they can ask for it. Right. You know, and certainly. I think that's one of the things many times that come out of this, these hearings are focused discussions that benefit the county commission. I think that's really one of our main objectives is to bring the things to the surface that then go in front of the county commission and both the staff and the applicant have the opportunity to be uh, more mindful and focused on some of those issues. Well, the county commission does not read our, our, our minutes. Uh, they're, they're included in the package, aren't they? I'm sure they study them yeah. extensively. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe there's a summary prepared, yeah. but the clerk's office prepares minutes in a timely matter, but not the next day. Cause no, no, no. Right. So if somebody doesn't object here, mm -hmm. this will be presented the same way it was just presented here, mm -hmm. and the same subject will come up, and concurrency will come up. And what we're saying is the, all they're responsible for is the what they add, but there's no way of doing that until they get it okay. Right. Uh, Mr. S Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Sebado for the clerk's office. Have you been um, sworn? In <laughs> <laughs> sworn out. Um, when it comes to comments that are made at the hearing, um, 
planning does ensure that all of the comments, especially from the public, are included with the agenda package for the item so that the board is aware of those comments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the public, they can email or call and, and, and reach out to the county commissioners so that they're aware that they also have concerns. And to that point, they don't have a three-minute limit when they do that. <laughs> they can make it as long as possible. Please be careful on cross issues. They can't call commissioners. This ex parte communication. Right, right. My the, apologies. Yeah, but they can email statements. Can There's email. no. They can call and talk to them. The commissioners can't respond. Yes. Yeah. So. And then it would have to be disclosed. No, they right. have. They have to come to the hearing under oath, provide testimony mm. if they want to be considered evidence in the record. Yes, ma'am. So, again, uh. uh I think uh, the topic is traffic on 60, so. Um. Well, but I'd also like to say that I, I don't agree to my, uh, my good friend and, and certainly much more wise and experienced uh, counsel, but I, I have to say that I see a lot of mixed-use projects, and this is, in my humble opinion, would be a multi-use project. And the fact that you use a single entrance to it doesn't make it mixed use. And I think one of the key things in urban design, and this is an urban core spot now, I mean, with the, what we've got as far as traffic and what they're having to do with roadways and where 60 is ultimately going to go. And I, I just think for us to say we're just going to put a patchwork of access points and call it mixed use um, is a, a prerogative you have. I may not share that opinion, and I think that's my comment, is mixed use is an integrated design that has multiple surfaces and acts like a mixed use project. This acts like a group of components that have a common access. And the fact that we have the ice skating ring that has access to the, to the, uh, the outlets and the outlets ultimately are going to go over to the north side where they're trying to put the hotels and that we have this access through there to the other retail and across the street to the Kmart. I think that's integration. I don't think you have integration. I think you've taken your spot and said, I'm going to put this here and this here, just like they were separate buildings. If you put a gas station on the corner or a grocery store or whatever you do, that's not mixed use. That's traditional development that has common access. And so I would just argue that on the basis of your request for a mixed use project, I don't think this meets that criteria. And, you know, the separate apartments with no integration of the retail, with, with commercial sites that face the highway and act off an access point that is traditional. I just think all those things are inconsistent. The, the traffic is another part of that because I think if you had a flow meter on these different access points, what you'd find is your 250 uh, apartment dwellers or your 700 for commercial would be dispersed and you wouldn't have the same impact that the traffic has, but that's a design issue. It's, a, it's the mixed use design which says, I don't have a single point of entry. And so on that basis and the lack of other integration other than saying the retail's here and the apartment's there, I just, I just humbly disagree. And, and that seems to lead to another component which then has this traffic issue to it. So I'm not gonna vote for it. I'm sure you'll get your approvals. I'm sure you'll press on, but I just feel like you, you guys can do better. ZNS can do better, the traffic guys can do better. And I just think, um, I, I think we can do stuff at a higher standard, and I think this, this site is a fantastic location. Everybody wants it there. But I think this is a design of convenience and not of consistent with uh, mixed use, in my opinion. I, I, listen, I'm, I'm off in a year. You guys can press on. Very good. Thank you. Any other deliberation amongst the uh, commission? Me. Okay. All right. Hearing no uh, additional deliberation, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion. Based upon the staff report, evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing, and find the request to be consistent with the Manti County Comprehensive Plan and the Manti County Land Development Code as, con as conditioned herein, I move to recommend adoption of Manti County Zoning Ordinance Number PDR 1905-ZG as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Smock, second. All right. The chair is going to call the matter to the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Uh, uh, verbals, please. Nay. Nay. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, chair votes aye. Motion passes four to two. And Mr. Rutledge, I think you've stated your objection. And just for, for the record, Mr. Roth, your objection is related to? Similar to Mr. Rutledge. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that concludes our uh, business of the day. So uh, with that, we're going to call the meeting to adjourn. And thank everybody very much.